Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Journal of Law and Public Policy's Spring 2020 Symposium. Uh, we're going to be talking about inequality of wealth, race, and class, equality of opportunity today. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for attending, and uh, we'll have more people filtering in as they get set up. Uh, but my name is Amanda Gonzalez. I am the uh, Journal Symposium Director, and I'm here with Dr. Reed, who will be helping moderate today. Dr. Reed. Are you ready for me? Fantastic. Yes. And, and I'd like to begin. My name is Charles Reed. I'm the faculty advisor to the Journal of Law and Public Policy. And before I say anything else, I want to give Amanda Gonzalez my my, my, my deepest appreciation. Uh, this has been a, 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 a crisis. Uh, it's been, we've had these unexpected turns of events. I'm very much a computer novice. Amanda has carried, uh, carried the weight just uh, heroically. She stands up there with Homer. She stands up there with the great heroes of the past. And uh, she's just been fantastic. I want to say that. And I'd like to welcome everyone here. Uh, virtually to the University of St. Thomas. If you're here, if you were here in person, you'd see our our atrium and our moot courtroom and all of this. I wish I could show that to everyone. We cannot, uh, but um, we we stand uh, here uh, uh, hosting a symposium that has, I think, tremendous uh, social relevance and consequence for um, for today's situation. It is focused on inequality of wealth, race, and class and equality of opportunity. The United States is a nation that has pledged itself to equality. It, 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 the, the, the Equal Protection Clause represents the embedding of a principle of equality within the Constitution of the United States. At the same time we stand for this principle formally, um, we see all around us uh, the evidence of enormous inequality, inequality of, uh, of wealth, inequality of race, inequality of, uh, uh, of social class, access to, access to justice, access to education. We see an array of, of vast inequality in the United States. And um, this is being revealed even more starkly with the, uh, with the, um, with the uh, emergence of the COVID crisis, uh, where we're seeing um, efforts now to marginalize the vulnerable, marginalize those who who are most susceptible to illness and say that perhaps their lives are not as important as other lives. Uh, we're seeing, in, in other words, uh, inequality revealing itself in very ugly manifestations. And uh, I hope uh, that um, this symposium may um, represent a, um, a, 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 a voice uh, standing in opposition to some of these trends. And uh, so, in a sense, th this uh, program is even more timely than than um, uh, it was when we planned it six, eight months ago. I'd like to begin uh, by introducing our first speaker this morning, Professor Diane Klein of the University of Laverne School of Law, uh, and she will be talking to us about housing, which is a, a, a strong element of of, uh, of inequality. Uh, Professor Klein comes to the teaching of law by, by uh, a very interesting background. As an undergrad, uh, she pursued a degree in philosophy at Harvard College, where her, her senior thesis advisor was John Rawls. She pursued graduate work at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she comes to us, in other words, with a, a tremendous sense of, of, of interdisciplinary insight and uh, I, she will bring all of this to bear in her presentation. Professor Klein, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Reed, for that introduction. Um, and I would also like to extend my thanks to Amanda Gonzalez, uh, the student editor of the journal, who decided to proceed under what are extraordinary circumstances. I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone. Uh, among law school faculty who have been receiving notices of cancellations of conferences and other professional events that we were hoping to participate in this semester. Uh, some may be stretching already out into the summer that have been called off. And I admire and feel very grateful for the opportunity to continue uh, to stay connected to my professional colleagues and to feel a little bit less isolated 
uh, at this very isolating time. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this event and a few other things in which I've had the opportunity to be involved in the past few weeks are actually going to forge some very interesting new professional connections for all of us going forward. Um, I think that it is actually an opportunity for our, at times, very hierarchical profession to reorganize itself a little bit horizontally through people finding shared interests and commonalities and asking and answering one another's questions about some of the challenges that we're all gonna be facing that we're currently in the midst of uh, and also uh, in the months and I think ultimately in the years to come. So the housing issue that I'm gonna be talking about uh, in, in some detail this morning is one that lots of people probably have not really heard of um, although some of the economic forces giving rise to it are, are only too familiar. So the, the title of the talk is Living Pod Share. I'm going to be talking about pod share housing. And the question that I, that I intended to pose when I, when I first put the presentation together and began thinking about it was to ask whether this is a genuinely critical intervention in the way that we think about housing, especially in major cities, or rather yet another trend or fad. Um, I don't wanna get myself too caught up in the, uh, is it a millennial fad? Um, and I'm not quite a boomer, I'm a little too young for that. Maybe I'm a Gen Xer, who knows? But I think one of the interesting questions that I hope we'll have a chance to think about a little bit is whether the way of living that I am about to describe uh, reflects something that is genuinely novel, genuinely a different and promising way to think about how people live in some of America's largest and most expensive cities, or rather whether it is going to be a sort of fly-by-night trend, this year's cool thing to do, uh, that may, uh, for some reasons that I'll be talking about, I hope, end up being one of the many casualties of the current crisis, even if it might have been a viable business model uh, in the time leading up to it. So I'll begin just by talking a little bit about what pod share housing is. Pod share housing is an idea that combines, if we think about it sort of as a, as a Venn diagram, uh, the youth hostel and the Japanese capsule hotel. So I would guess that most people know more or less how a hostel works for uh, impecunious travelers, generally teenagers and young adults. Uh, you can stay at a youth hostel where you have not too much by way of privacy. You've got a bed to sleep in, probably not a bedroom of your own a shared kitchen maybe, shared bathrooms, maybe some shared living space, tends to be dramatically cheaper than a hotel uh, in approximately the same location. And in a lot of places, in order even to be eligible to stay in a hostel, there are some international organizations that manage them, you cannot be a person who is local to the area. You have to be a traveler either from another state or another country. And the duration uh, for which you can stay at a youth hostel is often limited, sometimes to just a couple of nights, maybe seven nights or a little bit longer. But it, it's clear that the way hostels work is in support of traveling, you can't just move in, right? So that is not an option for the youth hostel. Uh, the, the next of the historical precursors, the ancestors of pod share housing is the Japanese capsule hotel. So uh, one of the benefits of doing this, uh, doing this webinar or seminar this way is that anyone can use their own computer to look up what a Japanese capsule hotel looks like if you haven't already seen it. Um, for, for lots of Westerners who have not seen them before, uh, it looks a little bit like a morgue, but they've cut out the middleman, right? They put you into a drawer and you sleep there for the night. Um, Lots of Westerners can't imagine sleeping. I mean, can't imagine being awake or asleep in a space as small as some of these spaces are. They are frequently on the order of seven feet by four feet by three feet. Uh, too, definitely too small to stand up for some people. Uh, you can't even sit up very comfortably. Uh, the, the benefit that they offer in an extremely dense city like Tokyo 
Uh, they originated in Japan and are more popular there than anybody else, than anywhere else, is the tremendous density that is possible in the hotel itself, which enables capsule hotels to be dramatically cheaper than any other, uh, any other hotel arrangement that might be available in a place like Tokyo. So just as hostels are much, much cheaper than hotels in the same city, so to the capsule hotel is much, much cheaper, generally less than $100 a night, um, which is a bargain in a lot of the cities uh, in Japan where capsule hotels are in use. It's important to keep in mind, uh, partly because Westerners often forget or, or don't pay attention to the fact that for the people who use capsule hotels in Japan, they use the communal facilities as well it is not that all you're getting for the night is this, this thing not much bigger than a morgue drawer, though it may have a tiny TV in there or a place to power up a laptop. There are also communal facilities, including places to watch television, some kind of sauna or spa, places to prepare food, or also places to buy food. And for the, the Japanese businessmen, and they are mostly businessmen, I'm gonna say a little bit about, about gender and living arrangements uh, a little later on. Uh, it is not just a place to sleep. It is also a place of sociality. And so it's not appropriately compared uh, simply to a hotel room, which for most Americans, when most Americans think of a hotel, other than maybe a bar or a restaurant, uh, what you are paying for primarily is, is the private space that you will be in, right? That is the space that has a closing door between you and the hall, you and the rest of the world. Whereas the Japanese capsule hotel, uh, you want to make sure that you're keeping in mind that it is as much a hotel as it is a capsule, right? It's not that you're only paying to be in this very tiny space. All you would do is sleep there um, as, as the hotels are envisioned to be used. The rest of the time, that is when you are in the hotel and awake, you would be in its communal space, interacting with the other, uh, the other people who are also staying there. Now, something that both capsule hotels and youth hostels have in common, uh, like other hotels, that is other, other uh, places to stay that are part of the hospitality industry uh, rather than the housing industry, is no one lives there. Right? The capsule hotels uh, evolved in Japan um, primarily to serve a market of businessmen who had very lengthy commutes and very long working hours. And so rather than taking a two hour train in one direction, only to sleep for a couple of hours and then take another two hour train in the other direction, um, people would use capsule hotels or do use capsule hotels during the week. Uh, they're near where they work. They arrive, uh, take a sauna or a shower, whatever it might be, um, and then sleep there and then go back to work the next day. But they live somewhere else, right? That is, the, the customers of the capsule hotel live somewhere else. And the customers of the youth hostel also live somewhere else. So the idea that kind of gave birth, we might say, to, to Podshare, and Podshare is just one of the companies that does this kind of thing, um, but they are, uh, I think, in some ways, the most interesting, most theoretically evolved, from their own point of view at least, is what if there were a place to live that was like this? Right? That is, what if instead of having to pull together all the money that you could to pay a first, last, and security deposit on a tiny studio in the city that you wanted to live in, you could instead have a place to live that otherwise functioned much more like a hostel or a capsule hotel. In other words, you can pay by the week, you can even pay by a single night at a time, like a hotel, but a local person can live there and there's no time limit on how long you can live there. Similarly, picking up also on ideas from both the hostel and the capsule hotel, uh, the space that each individual uh, customer has access to, they call them uh, pedestrians, which is a little, a little cute for my taste, um, but the people who live there uh, have a space to sleep that is about the same size as the capsule in a Japanese capsule hotel, often with nothing but a curtain or some other kind of flimsy covering at the end of it, set up often uh, kind of loft style, 
a little bit like the way that some dorm rooms are set up or some hostels are set up, um, but without privacy, and that is on principle. So the sleeping space and the living space, any kitchen, access to bathrooms and so on is all communal. So the, the third of the ancestors, I think theoretical and otherwise to, to pod share housing uh, is the commune right, in which there is a deliberate attempt to reduce privacy. It's not as much privacy as you can get under the circumstances. It's deliberately arranged to reduce privacy to just about the barest minimum uh, that I think most people, at least most people raised in the West under more or less middle class circumstances would be willing to tolerate, right? The only privacy you have is when you are asleep um, in a pod that's not quite as tightly sealed as the capital hotel model, um, but is that's, that is where you are um, if you want to be alone. If you don't want, if you're not actually in the little sleeping area, uh, you will be in an area that is communal and intended to be, and this is where it deviates, I think, in some ways, both from the hostel, um, maybe it's a little more like uh, a capsule hotel in this respect. It is intended to be comfortable, and there are some people who have built out this model uh, who would describe the communal spaces as luxurious. That is, not only is it nice, maybe as nice as a fancy hotel or as a fancy uh, apartment building in, in one of America's most desirable cities. It has much nicer amenities than many of the people who live there would expect at the budget that they are in a position to pay or are willing to pay. So frequently uh, the pod share housing facilities, it's hard to know exactly what to call them, um, apartment buildings does not quite capture it, of course, because there is not there is not the level of privacy we would associate with an apartment. Um, often have uh, laundry service, housekeeping service, gyms, flat screen TVs, nicer furniture than the kind of thing that most people uh, would associate with a you know a first apartment after college or something like that, where you, you're going to be shopping at a secondhand store and trying to find a couch that you can that you and your roommate can drag up the stairs or or whatever the case may be. So the vision of PodShare's founder, uh, a young woman named Elvina Beck, is was from her own experience. Uh, both, what would it be like to live in a hostel, right? What if it was a hostel, but you didn't have to leave? And that those who wish to travel, whether they are digital nomads or people who are otherwise, or otherwise organize their, their life in order to maximize their travel, uh, could come to her. So the, the pod share housing facility that she built out for herself in downtown LA is where she has been living for the last seven or eight years with its revolving cast of people who come through, uh, who can live there. And this is, this is typical of the model, not just hers, but some others. Um, it costs about $1,000 a month. So in a place like Los Angeles or New York or San Francisco, um, what you could get for $1,000 a month, if it was not in this kind of arrangement, uh, would be at best a bedroom that you might be sharing with somebody else in an apartment that you would most assuredly be sharing with several other people um, with the all of the potential psychodrama and problems that are associated with such a thing. And it wouldn't be as nice a place as a pod share facility in at least some respects. But what you would have, which is the thing that I think is it has is so interesting about it and has become even even more interesting at this moment in time, is some measure of privacy. And that is, even if you are sharing an apartment with a few people, if you have a bedroom to yourself, you have a door you can close between you and the rest of the world. Even if you are sharing a bedroom, as, as many middle class and upper middle class people would have done, for example, at college, you just have one person with whom to work out um, your own desire for privacy. That is, if you want to spend the night with your boyfriend, right, your roommate goes somewhere else or vice versa, et cetera. But of course, in most of those kinds of shared living situations, such as the college dorm, there is somewhere else uh, that most people imagine that they live and where all their stuff is. So I wanna talk a little bit about pod share housing from the point of view of, of people who live there, 
uh, what it off what you what you get and what you give up uh, for your a thousand dollars a month or so. Um, and then I also want to talk a little bit about um, the way that I'm thinking about pot share housing, particularly in light of this in this of this recent crisis. So, as I mentioned earlier, but I'll I'll say a little bit more about. Part of the impetus for pod share housing at the at the more macroeconomic level is how very, very expensive it has become to live in most of America's most desirable cities. Um, it, if a person cannot put together a few thousand dollars, a first month, last month at the security deposit, it is very difficult to find a place to live. There are acute housing shortages. Um, we are already probably a generation past most people in their 20s, maybe even in their 30s, imagining that they would be able to buy a home on the salary that they can realistically expect to make uh, with the education level that most people are in a position to obtain for themselves by their early 20s. Even those in highly compensated professions, uh, new young lawyers, for example, um, I think mostly don't imagine uh, that they would be able to buy a house in a few years, even if paying for an apartment um, near where they work, even if that is downtown San Francisco or Los Angeles or even New York, um, is affordable. And even if it's affordable, it's expensive, right? That is, the cost of one's housing eats up a very substantial fraction of someone's after-tax earnings. That makes it hard for people who have not yet been in a position to accumulate any wealth to do so. And as most people are familiar with, being able to buy the place you live has, has been for a century or more uh, the most realistic uh, way to accumulate any substantial amount of wealth or put oneself in a position to transfer that wealth intergenerationally. Um, and that is, of course, because of the increase in home values that has pretty much reliably happened over the course of the past 50 years or more, uh, notwithstanding shocking downturns and collapses in the market. And access to the accumulation of wealth by the acquisition of real estate in the United States also has a heavily racialized character, uh, even where we have come closer to, to uh, closing gaps between different racial groups in terms of income. That gap has not yet begun to close where wealth is concerned and uh, historical discrimination in the acquisition of housing, redlining, loans, credit, and so on uh, is a big contributor to that. So when we think about trying to find a place to live um, in some of America's largest cities today, we, we are doing so against a background of large scale structural racism that has profoundly affected access to wealth and to housing um, for decades. So when we think about who's likely to uh, want to take advantage of something like pod share housing, what are they, what are they giving up and what are they getting? Um, its affordability is obviously its primary selling point. So there are a handful of more communal apartments um, that, have, that have been developed in some other places, including especially New York, um, but they're a little bit less interesting to me um, from this point of view because some of them are basically just as expensive as any other way you might live in New York. They're more like living in a luxury hotel um, where your hotel room is very, very small than they are a deliberate attempt at a more communal style of living uh, as is happening um, in, in the pod share setting, right? So the pod share setting in, in theoretical terms at least um, is supposed to combine something like a hostel with something like a commune. And the, uh, the creator of pod share housing has, has written at some length about her, her theory um, about what pod share housing can do. And it is not simply that it provides an affordable way to live uh, for a gig economy worker or for someone who's making enough money that they actually want to try to save and possibly buy a place or or change their living arrangement. That is that it is an inherently kind of transitional housing that we might think of as equivalent to uh, that first studio or that first post-college apartment or that apartment you get uh, when you have your first job. She also uh, regards this, and I think it's this will start to bring us closer to uh, our current crisis. She also regards this way of living as a critical intervention in the problem of 
loneliness and isolation um, in today's world. So in, in some of what she has written about this, she discusses in a, in a quite explicit way that part of the, the concept of this living arrangement is that it will increase unplanned encounters with people you don't know. And so one of the ways that I sometimes think about this when I, when I contrast ways of living in uh, New York and Los Angeles, both places where I have spent some time, uh, living in Los Angeles, even, even prior to the crisis, if you live in a relatively private housing situation, I own the condo that I live in, it would certainly be possible for me to wake up in the morning in my condo, go down to the parking garage alone in an elevator, get into my car, drive to work, right? Get out, be, you know, go upstairs in an elevator, be alone in my office, then I might teach a class, right, that has 50 people in it or more. I might go to the office of a colleague, um, return to my office, return to my car, drive home, return to the condo. And, the, and what that description is designed to show is that if desired, I could reduce my level of unplanned interactions with strangers down to almost zero, almost zero. Now, occasionally, right, I'm going to go to the grocery store and see people who I don't already know, uh, go to the gym and see people who might be regulars, but not necessarily known to me. But in the course of the average day, I could have very, very few encounters with people who I wasn't choosing to interact with and with whom I did not plan the interaction and where I couldn't exit the interaction if I didn't like it, right? That is, I might encounter somebody in the parking lot, but then I can go into my home or go into my office, et cetera. Uh, there, there certainly is some sociology to suggest, and I find it credible, that this very low rate of unplanned interactions is not very good for human beings. Now, that's not to say that there aren't unplanned interactions that have negative consequences, but when we think of the deterioration of communal ties in lots of places in America, the very low rate of unplanned interactions is a piece of that. Is it a cause? Is it an effect? Right, that I, I might leave to some of the sociologists. But it is true that many Americans in many places, and of course America is lots of places all at the same time where people live in lots of different ways. Um, for many Americans in many places, the rate of unplanned interactions is very, very low. Now I would say, and, and uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo has remarked upon this, I think, eloquently, uh, particularly under the circumstances, that we might think of a place like New York as at the opposite extreme. Right? It's very difficult to live in a place like New York City without having lots of unplanned interactions all day long, right? because of the way people are on the street, because of the use of mass transit, because of the density. Um, the way that people live is quite different. And as we have seen, perhaps dangerous in certain ways, which is, I think, such an interesting flip side of thinking about the way that human beings live and how humans' interactions with one another uh, have both benefits and risks and how we, how we manage both of those. But for people who are compelled by the idea that an isolated life with very few unplanned interactions is not perhaps such a good thing, right, who may feel um, nostalgic for uh, environments where that was less true, right? A college environment is one where there are many more unplanned interactions per day, I think. Um, then living pod share may seem appealing, um, at least at that theoretical level. And I, I will put to, to each, each viewer and listener what, what your own reaction is to imagining giving up privacy so nearly completely. Uh, to live in this communal way where you have no more space to yourself uh, than basically what you could fit in in the space under a bunk bed. Um, if, if you immediately ask yourself, where do you put all your stuff? That's a natural question. And this way of living is designed to disfavor the accumulation of stuff at the very least. Now, there's, it's a little bit unclear in some of the things that I've read about, about most of the people who actually live here, whether what we're imagining is that there is a parent's house somewhere where all your stuff is, 
Uh, so people are traveling. They're traveling with what they can carry in a backpack maybe, but somewhere else is all their stuff. Or whether a significant number of the people who are adopting this way of living really are deliberately not accumulating stuff. That is, they don't have a kitchen full of stuff. They don't have bookcases full of books. They don't have closets full of clothes. They don't have kitchens full of pots and pans. Um, the, they instead think of most of the impedimenta of living as many of us might think about the equipment that's at our gym. Right? I belong to a gym. I don't have a treadmill and weight machines in my house, nor do I need them, nor do I want them. I, that is, I'm happy to let someone else make the capital investment in that equipment, just so long as I have access to it when I need it. And that's kind of the idea that, that she and, and others who are promoting this way of living are suggesting. You don't need to own things like everything that you need to cook in a kitchen, uh, just so long as you have access to them. You don't need to own a flat screen TV, just so long as you have access to it when you want to watch a movie. You don't need to own a recliner or a couch or a kitchen table, so long as you have access to those things when you need them. So one, another of the things in which this is intended to be a kind of critical intervention is materialism and acquisitiveness, right? That is how much stuff do you really need, right? And why do you have the attachment to stuff that you have? If you had access to it, what are the things you would be willing to do without owning um, if you could get their use value, right? Without actually having to purchase them and how would that change your ideas about how much money you need to live, right? How much of the way that we think about that is influenced by our sense of the things we will need to acquire and what it will cost to do that. So first I would encourage people to think about, um, and I'm continuing myself to think very much about, what it would be like to live uh, effectively without privacy from people with whom one would be having a relatively high number of unplanned interactions. Right? Uh, I was a single mother. I lived for many years without privacy, right? I have to remind myself that I have the right to close the bathroom door, right? Because I was, you know, at a certain point, you just give that up if you've got little kids at home, especially if you're the only adult around. So there's privacy. And then there's unplanned interactions with strangers, right? So some people like a lot of privacy, really do like to live alone. Right For other people, so long as the people who are around a great deal of the time are your loved ones, uh, that may have its stresses and strains, but it's not, one does not experience that psychic loss of privacy, right? That is that I need to be alone feeling, which I think people have to a different degree and is obviously uh, highly, highly acculturated. So some of the other questions that immediately came to my mind uh, in thinking about, about pod share housing and how it might work, again, in some ways derived from both the, the hostel and the, and the capsule hotel, is intimacy of all kinds um, and the ways in which that crosses over with gender. So the Japanese capsule hotels were, for the first few decades of their existence, men only. Um, not, not legally in a direct way, although legally in an indirect way, which I found quite interesting. Uh, Japan is a place that has shared public baths. They are gender segregated and the capsule hotels tend to include a facility that is like that. Because the public bath is gender segregated, the capsule hotel is then gender segregated. So it is not that you couldn't have a capsule hotel for both men and women, you could, there's no law against it. What you can't have is a public bath used by both men and women. So once you've created a public bath that can only be used by men, the capsule hotel a fortiori, right, would be used only by men. Now in the past decade or so, there are a handful of women only capsule hotels that have opened. And there are also capsule hotels that have now modified their facilities so that there are floors for men and floors for women. Uh, we could have a separate conversation about how this works for persons of non-binary gender and gender non-conforming people more generally. Uh, it definitely rests upon a strongly binary model of gender, but it's not our subject today. Um, so I'll, I'll bring us back to, uh, to pod share housing, which is absolutely, to use a, an old-fashioned, a now old-fashioned American expression, 
uh, co-ed, that is both men and women uh, live in, in uh, pod share housing. But pod share housing, because the only privacy you have is again, more or less the, the bottom half of a bunk bed, is a place where uh, sex is against the rules, or at least sex with other people is against the rules. Um, and from what I can gather, those rules are pretty much enforced. Um, not only is sexual intimacy impossible in this setting, that is against the rules, although exactly how that's policed, I do not have as clear an idea about as, as I would ultimately want to have. Um, but uh, pod share housing, unlike uh, the 1960s commune, is not a place as a result where children are going to be conceived, born, or grow up. So pod share housing is not an intergenerational arrangement, again, unlike a commune, but like a youth hostel uh, or a capsule hotel. And I think so, so long as that is part of the way it is envisioned, while people might be able to live in that setting and grow older there, they won't bring up families there. And, and from my point of view, that, that creates a certain kind of artificiality um, that is, it is almost, it, it seems to me, inherently going to be the way people might live for a period of their lives. Not because I think everybody has to grow up, get married and have children, but because statistically speaking, many people will want to live part of their life in a family setting uh, with which pod share housing, at least as currently understood, is, is incompatible. And that's one of the ways in which this kind of housing is different than, for example, a couple of families getting together and buying a large home that might have been designed to be the home for a single nuclear family, but now has multiple nuclear families living there or multiple roommates or friends. Um, another thing that I think intersects with this trend a little bit, it's a response to unaffordability, um, the inability to buy a single family home, on a single salary or even on two salaries, but that I think doesn't go quite all the way to, to pod share housing as, as a way of thinking about how people might live. So the impossibility of intimacy and privacy, which are related to each other, but not identical, I think are, are an interesting feature of a kind of desexualized way of thinking about domesticity uh, that I think is is interesting and thought provoking in a variety of ways. Um, the last few comments that I want to make before I hope we can have a, a discussion about about this way of living and and whether we think it's a potential critical intervention in the high cost of housing, um, or is instead something else uh, that's less likely to survive. Uh, there there are two topics that I want to talk about um, remaining. One has to do with uh, some of the financial realities around pod share housing, um, which I hope will then uh, allow me to segue into thinking about pod share housing in, in the age of COVID-19. So pod share housing is affordable and accessible for those who live there. That is part of what it is intended to be. And over the course of the, the last several years in which it has developed, it has mostly retained that character, setting aside what we might think of as the, the luxury or high-end pod share living arrangements that, are, that are, have also come into being um, a little bit in New York, a little bit in San Francisco. But when we think about pod share housing from the point of view of the landlord and the real estate developer, uh, we see a rather different picture. Because pod share housing reduces the space that each individual is renting, which is after all what they are doing. It increases the density um, from the point of view of the real estate developer and thus increases the price per square foot that the real estate developer will get out of the pod share housing development. It thus is appealing for real estate developers and venture capitalists who are in this space if they think it's actually viable. Right? In other words, if you can get 15 people paying $1,000 a month to live in a space of a particular size in, down, in, in downtown San Francisco, that is more lucrative than four or five apartments at $2,000 a piece. Right? That is, if you've got people packed in more tightly, uh, landlords have realized since time immemorial, even if you're charging each of them less in the aggregate, you will be making more. 
right? And so it's not at all clear to me that it will reduce as opposed to contribute to inequality um, if landlords think they can pack people in more tightly. Uh, again, this is something landlords have been doing since forever. Um, and one of the things that's sometimes troubling to me uh, in, the, in the pod share ethos is that it seems to be a way of mystifying people into thinking that they're getting more when they're really getting less. Um, many of us are descended by one or two or probably by now three generations uh, from people who lived cheek by jowl with one another um, in New York or in Chicago in immigrant communities. Uh, which people got out of when they could because living in conditions as crowded as that was not regarded as desirable by anyone who was doing it. Finding a way to sell back to people uh, what many people formerly worked hard to escape from um, is a very interesting phenomenon, I think, to me. Um, thinking about whether it is, it is very much old wine and new wineskins being sold back to people in a way to encourage them to settle for less and think they're getting more, or whether it really is different in some way um, because of its communal aspect or because people have chosen it or, or because it is intended critically to intervene in people's ideas about acquisition, materialism, uh, how much privacy people really need, et cetera. I mean, this, this is part of what is, is so theoretically interesting to me um, about it. And, and that brings us to uh, living pod share in the time of coronavirus. Those collisions, those unplanned interactions with strangers, we all now realize um, are a vector of danger and not just of community in a world where this viral outbreak, this, this pandemic is gonna reshape our world in, in lots of ways we can't predict. Um, but one of the things I think we can safely predict is that this is not the last such occurrence of its kind. Right? That is, it's not by accident that uh, at the time of the prior presidential transition, one of the three most significant crises that was modeled for the incoming Trump administration was a pandemic. Um, we all have our opinions and we probably share our opinions. Uh, about how it could possibly be that that was not taken seriously by the incoming administration and that no preparation was made for it. Um, but the only point I'm making now is that attentive world leaders have been well aware that pandemics present tremendous threats to populations, to national security, uh, and to our national economies. They've been aware of this for a long time. Um, what we are seeing now is a worldwide experiment in better and worse reactions and responses to that situation, but the situation is still a real one. And on the other side of this crisis in the United States, people will know things about isolating themselves, about quarantining themselves, about reducing those unplanned interactions back down towards zero that many of us were not aware of before. And one of the first things that I thought of when, as this crisis broke out, even as the planning was moving forward for this event, and I wasn't sure if it was going to happen live, if it was going to happen by, by Zoom, et cetera, was whether those pod share housing um, facilities or buildings or places were going to be hot spots for spreading the virus because people were living under circumstances that seemed to me optimal for viral shedding and spreading um, with a changing semi-transient population that would not be easy to isolate um, and that also included, as has turned out to be the case, uh, people without a great deal of financial wherewithal um, and thus those who would be hit very hard by the lockdown, by the squeeze that has been placed on the gig economy in a place like Los Angeles, the people using pod share housing are going to include lots of people in the entertainment gig economy. I, I personally know lots of people who are circus performers and things like that, um, and also people in the restaurant business and people who are driving Uber or Lyft while they're shopping that screenplay around. You know, those sorts of cliches are cliches because they really do describe the life circumstances of lots of people. And sure enough, when I reached out to uh, Elvina Beck at the beginning of this week to ask how things are going, 
um, although there was no there's no official comment from PodShare about what is happening in in PodShare facilities. Uh, there was another announcement that I, I I will indulge myself as a you know very very tail end of the baby boomer oldest Gen Xer in saying. Um, it, it will go on my top 10 list of most millennial things ever, and that is that Elvina Beck has arranged a GoFundMe fundraiser for her own tenants because they can't pay her rent, right? So the, the founder of PodShare is, is not just pedestrian number one living in this facility. She's also a landlord, right? She's a landlord whose tenants who owe her about $250 a week, $1,000 a month, many of them can't pay the rent. Um, but but it's, it's probably a new intervention uh, to have your landlord holding a GoFundMe fundraiser for their own tenants. But she's doing it um, and managing, has managed so far to raise a few thousand dollars to allow some of the people who are living in uh, the PodShare facility in downtown LA to remain there at least a week or two at a time as presumably she negotiates with her own landlord who in turn is negotiating with their mortgage holder and so on on up the line um and so for me the the most recent lessons um both about whether a pod share place is a safe place to be living and isolating that is how you actually manage that when you have embraced a, a transitory uh, a, tr a transitory living environment with a high rate of unplanned collisions as part of its ethos, um, and also how you fit economically any model that seeks to be really meaningfully different um, when real estate ownership, real estate development, and the relationship between landlords and tenants uh, seems to be more or less inescapable. Um, those are two of the things that I'm thinking about as as we think about whether whether a model like pod share living uh, will survive the current crisis uh, and how viable it will be um, as as a possible answer to a question being faced in every American in every virtually every American city as they become uh, less and less affordable to live in, which is how will people continue to afford to live in America's cities. So, questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, Professor Klein, thank you so much for your presentation. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you fine. Wonderful. I, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, and that is, uh, the first question is, does pod share um, housing actually reflect some deeper underlying structural inequalities? For instance, uh, housing is at an enormous premium in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, New York. We, we, we know this. At the same time, housing in Detroit and much of the midsection of the United States is at an all-time low in cost. Are we really seeing issues of, of, of structural unfairness in the emergence of pod share housing? Well, I think there are a few things to say about that that are that are interesting and that are really going to be interesting in in the years to come. As people are doing more distance work, telework, I mean, as we're all doing now, so this is one of the great, in addition to the great distance education experiment, um, many, many millions of people in the United States are now engaged in the great uh, distance work, tele, telework experiment. And I think one of the things that's very interesting is whether someone who discovers that they can work for their New York law firm from Boston, as my daughter is doing, will think, you know, I could probably work for my New York law firm from Detroit. I could work for my New York, for my New York law firm from a place where I could easily buy a house on what they pay me. Do I want to do that, right? Or is living in some of the places that people want to work also very desirable. And so thinking about whether we will end up, I mean, I think many of us have have thought about or know about um, you know, call centers that have been taken offshore to places where labor is cheap. It's interesting to think about whether we might see a similar stratification in the American economy. Uh, why, why shouldn't that New York law firm take 100 lawyers and put them in Detroit, right? Where yeah, a, all buy a house. Right? 
Um, and after I, all, the clients don't know the difference, right? Yeah. Because you're meeting with them just like this, right? You can decorate your home office so it looks just like you're there at your office in New York and who will be the wiser? Yes. And I think that is, is just a really fascinating thing to think, right? When we think about the why it is that in in the rust belt right there's been a real estate collapse right it's because we think of where you live and where you work as standing in an intimate and necessary connection right mediated by something like commute times right and and we saw this in tokyo too right that is in tokyo there are people who commute two hours each way um i have occasionally had to do that but i don't like it um and most people think a shorter commute is better, right? But how about the commute to your second bedroom, right? What do we think about taking the commute down to zero through distance work? I think really fascinating. I think that the, the, there is an issue there. And the issue I see is sociability. Sociability is important. It's important for several reasons. You interact with your colleagues, of course, but you also interact with others. You interact with others and on an unplanned basis every day. These unplanned interactions lead to the development of, of ideas, of opportunities. Yeah. You lose that with, 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 with Zoom. You lose that with, with distance commuting of the, sort, of the sort we're necessarily engaged in here. Um, at the same time, it, 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 it works to relieve the, the worst burdens of, uh, of inequality of housing. Maybe, right, maybe, yeah. right? It holds out that possibility. And I think that's, I think that's just very fascinating, right? That is, it, it is something that is, I mean, I, I, ordinarily, I think, and certainly structurally frequently, that there's nothing new under the sun. But I think the idea that you could choose where to live and where to work in a way that is completely disconnected, that's fascinating. That's but fascinating. What? One final question. If that's so, and if one of the consequences of COVID is to accelerate the trends to di di distance legal practice, your, 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 your lawyers are in Detroit while they're, they're practicing virtually in New York, does that mean PodShare has a future or not? Well, it's, it's interesting. And, and the, the business that is probably really that's really engaged with that in the most uh, in the most up close way people have probably heard of it is we work right which yes. is a, a communal setting for work one of the things that the we work people have found uh, to their dismay and and surprise is that the we work model did not transition very well into the we live model because they actually did open some we live facilities mm -hmm. And it didn't explode anything like the way that we work did. So for those of us who are more sort of theoretically and sociologically inclined, right, I, we can't help but think that that's because there are very deep differences in the way people want to work and the way people want mm -hmm. to live, right? And, and that's, that's right. Um, but from a real estate developer's point of view, real estate developer has a somewhat different view about this. And so I've become more sophisticated about some of these things. It is, as it turns out, dramatically easier to take a large existing space and just throw an almost unlimited number of desks and phones in there, right, which is what happens mm -hmm. when you convert a space into a WeWork space, than it is to make spaces people are willing to live in. So one of, one of the features of that, which again, I've, I've become more sophisticated about this than I used to be, is that people really like natural light where they live. To live in a space where there is no natural light on any side, that is a very hard sell. Not so for offices, right? Those offices can be built and lit in such a way that when you imagine, if you imagine a floor of a very large office building, right? So it's got windows on its outer sides, but most of the inner space, you put walls there and there would be no natural light. You put apartments mm -hmm. there and nobody wants to live in them. Right. Oh, I, 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 that goes back 2,000 years. My PhD is in Roman, uh, Roman law, and you see cases in Roman law from the first century uh, where the, 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 you have these enormous contests over the right to natural light. Right. And so that... The intense that, Roman housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, again, it, it comes into it in, 
do I think that pod share housing, I, I mean, that's the question, right? The question is, as, as the structure of work changes, because I do think, I mean, I, I, this is my prediction, um, you know, others will be others will be betting on different outcomes, but I do think that one of the consequences of this crisis is going to be a dramatic acceleration of both distance learning and distance working. Um, yes, and I, I think it's partly because it's going to be cheaper for the people who will benefit from making it cheaper. Um, those are not the people performing the work, by the way, um, but I, I think that's going to happen. I think the question is whether it will still be desirable enough to live in places like New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, et cetera, mm -hmm. that these more innovative ways of making it affordable, even if they, they maybe are really just a dressed up version of New York's now illegal SRO hotels or uh, you know, overcrowded tenements, Right. That is, is pod share just another name for tenement? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> is, uh, yes. Is a question, right? I mean, I think that mm -hmm. is, really a, is, is really an open question or whether, again, as, as I suggested, my daughter, who's, who's a second year associate um, at a New York law firm who's now working, uh, you know, is in semi-quarantine with her boyfriend in, in Revere, Massachusetts, whether it will occur to both her and the partners she works for that it really doesn't matter where she lives and whether whether in that setting and of course that's that's a high end employer it's just one little piece of the puzzle but whether an employer who could easily afford to fly her into new york for one mm -hmm. week out of the month might not care where she lives the rest of the time mm -hmm. and then whether she will say it doesn't matter i want to live in hell's kitchen anyway or i want to live in brooklyn anyway or whether she'll say why not live in LA where I grew up? Why not live in Detroit where I can buy a house? Why not live by the beach? But there is also the kinetic energy, the excitement uh, that uh, is derived from those unplanned interactions. And New York yeah. is New York is famous for that, of course. That's that's the the, the attraction of New York. Yeah. yeah, that's New York, right? Well, and it's interesting to think about how many of the people who live and work there wouldn't if they could work there while not living there yeah. and how mm -hmm. anywhere else i mean I, it's funny i actually think of this in reverse because i i have a friend this is now many years ago um when in a conversation about people with long commutes um but who lived on the lower east side and taught at a law school in ohio to which he flew back and forth every week because mm -hmm. he just couldn't not live in new york right it didn't matter to him that he worked in ohio he still had to live in New York because of what it meant to him to live in New York. Yes, I have a friend who does that now from uh, New York to University of Iowa, yes. Right, and mm -hmm. I mean, if the University of Iowa told that person that they didn't have to come back to campus at all, or they only had to be on campus one week out of the term, would that be the best news mm -hmm. they ever heard? Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. I've dominated the, the question and answers. There are, there are others, uh, I'm sure, who want to get in. Amanda? We do have two questions in the Q&A chat. OK. Uh, do, you first, want, do you want to read them I, in? I can read them, yep. First one, um, in times where there are a lot of multifamily dwellings and when the country must social distance from others, what solutions are there for people living in pod share housing? Yeah, that's the question that I wanted to put to Elvina Beck, right, that I couldn't get an answer to, right? Um, I would assume they have locked it down, but I don't know how, what you would need to do in that kind of situation to avoid transmission um, of a virus as transmissible as this one. I would guess that everybody there has been exposed. Um, how, how could it be avoided? People are living deliberately in quarters, basically ideal for the transmission of this virus. And even if a serious commitment is made to keeping the place clean, which it probably is, I would guess that pay places that are paying someone to clean are, are cleaner than where I've been living until I've now had to acquire this, this hobby of cleaning something because I'm lying on my floor looking at it or whatever. Um, I think these are dangerous places inherently. 
from this point of view. And I don't know what they're doing. I mean, I, you know, again, I, I, I have some questions out to try to get a sense of it. But if you take 15 or 20 people who, who have this kind of, se it seems to me this kind of semi-intimacy is just about the riskiest thing there is uh, from this point of view. And so I don't, I don't know whether, whether this way of living will come to seem dangerous. I mean, and that's, that's without getting into some of the other dangers that I think are potentially posed of criminal conduct, of invasion of privacy, of identity theft, and all kinds of other things uh, that come from people living together who do not have some of the pre-existing social ties that are more typical of those who are living together. It's dangerous, and I don't know. I mean, it's, it is a, it's a miniature version of the danger that is, that is posed, I think, to incarcerated populations. I mean, with, with, with which it has some similarities <laughs> other than you know, the most obvious difference that people in pod share housing are there voluntarily. May, may I jump in with a sure. question that just came across my screen from Hallie Martin? Okay. And she raises a very important question. And that question is, uh, is, is distance um, work really another manifestation of social economic inequality? She puts it, not everyone has the luxury of working at a distance. And indeed, let me develop that point. I teach labor law, let me develop this point. We have a service industry that requires uh, continuous close contact between res you know, the, the, the employees and, and the place of employment. And are we simply, when we talk about distance uh, uh, work, are we simply creating then, and this, I think this is um, uh, Howie, Howie Martin's question, creating another venue for, oper for inequality. Yes, and I think this, it's interesting because I think it has, it has a couple of sides, um, <clears throat> at least. Uh, maybe it has many, many sides. There are some functions that continue to have to be performed by human beings in close contact with one another. Um, I have friends who are masseuses, for example. Now, there may, there may come a time in our lifetime when there are robot masseurs, but even, even if we get there, there, that is still a thing that will be performed by human beings upon one another. There are other categories of work that we imagined for a long time had to be done that way, but we are discovering to our, perhaps to our surprise, don't necessarily have to be done that way. Uh, teaching is one of them. Medicine is one of them, right? That can be done more and more at a distance. Who can and who can't be at a distance? I think part of what's interesting about that to me, and this I'm early in my thinking about it, is that is, a, is my sense that it will be both the highest and the lowest status positions that will be performed by human beings in close proximity mm -hmm. with with a vast and growing gap in the middle, right? That is, there will come a time when seeing a doctor in person is a luxury good, right? When seeing- It almost is already. Right, is a luxury good. And it, then it's interesting to think about things at the other end of the scale, right? That is people, and, and I mean, again, there's a lot that's very fascinating to think about. Part of this I thought about when uh, it was announced that Prince Charles uh, had had tested positive for the coronavirus because what I, what I thought was one of the things that's interesting about that is are there reasons he he's obviously going to get better medical care than most of the world can get but he's not insulated from it because of two aspects of his extremely high status life one is that he was frequently in some proximity to large crowds and the other is that he has a staff of human beings mm -hmm. coming into and out of his space and then going home to somewhere else, right? Prince Charles is not waited on by robots. He's waited on by real live human beings with all the risks that are inherent in that. And that is, that cuts across class, leaving out a bunch of people in the middle who are then insulated. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fascinating. I mean, it, it certainly is, is I mean, and, and also to, to the point that was raised, 
of course, I mean, it's, I think of different things when I see the comment in the comment box, right? Not everyone has the luxury of working from home. Uh, is it a luxury? In some ways, <laughs> it's a luxury to work from home. And it, that means at least two things, right? It, it, to me, to, uh, that's, that statement itself suggested two rather different things to me, right? One is not everyone lives in a place that is compatible with the kind of work they do. Right? This, is, this is one of the things that we're, we're learning in distance education, right? That is, many students have returned home to an environment much less academically congenial than the one they were living in when they were at school, mm -hmm. right? for a variety of reasons, digital divide reasons, but also space reasons, family responsibility reasons, noise, space to work, et cetera. But then also, not everyone has the luxury of working from home because some people's work requires them to be somewhere other than their own home, right? And so there's a lot that's built into that, right? And I think the luxury of working from home is itself a really interesting concept, right? The idea that mm -hmm. that is a luxury. And it, it also puts me in mind, again, it's a bit of a digression for us, but it, this connects to so many things. It puts me in mind of the Industrial Revolution itself, right? Of the yes. fact that before the Industrial Revolution, a seamstress mm -hmm. had the luxury of working at home, if we were typically to put it that did, way, yes. Which mm -hmm. is to say that she was cooking and cleaning and raising children in the same place that she was sewing those dresses one at a time until she left home to go work in the factory, which is the luxury, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the luxury. Is neither of them a luxury, right? It, it's uh, fascinating to me. We do have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, I'm going to combine two because they're asking things that I think can be answered in one question. Um, but first, how um, receptive do you think the United States would be about pot sharing, considering we have a different concept of privacy than people who are living in other countries where this has been um, successful? And do you feel that this would just be limited to bigger cities, or is this a concept that um, could be utilized in rural areas where there's uh, different housing issues? Well, my my response to that, I think, is mostly is mostly around whether we think that what sustains pod share housing is primarily economic or primarily social. So, if I, I think the driver is primarily economic, right? The idea was you can't otherwise afford to live in LA proper, in Manhattan, in San Francisco, but now you can, right? The driver is economic. And for people who, for whom that continues to be the primary concern, it will create sustainability if people can stand the loss of privacy. Because to me, that is the big trade-off, especially for Americans, right? Whatever we might think about whether it's possible to think differently about privacy, that's a big transition, that privacy slash intimacy issue for Americans. Are they willing to give it up in order to live in downtown LA, San Francisco, New York? But if the model itself is sustainable because of what it offers socially, then it might be able to be made appealing in a place where you don't have to do it. In other words, it might not be competitive primarily on the basis of price, but rather on the basis of what else it offers, right? And the question is, is are the other things that it offers compelling to people? And that's, that's an ongoing experiment. I mean, the, the larger version of this project, um, in the larger version of this project, I talk about two things that appeal, I think, to the same at least in a general way to the same demographic group as pod share housing, but reflect in a way the contrary impulse. And that is the tiny house movement and the van life movement, right? So people who are tricking out a van, right? That kind of overlaps with the traveling idea of pod share, right? You can be in this pod share facility this week and in another one next week and another one next month or in a different city next month, right? The van life idea kind of picks up on that. The tiny house movement is how space constrained are you willing to be to have a place of your own? But what the tiny house movement and van life both 
either take as not to be questioned or provide is privacy. Privacy, right? But at an affordable rate. And what tiny houses and vans don't give you are unplanned interactions and sociability, right? It's you or you and your partner or you and your child in your tiny house, you and your partner, you and your child in your van, right? That is, it retains that commitment to privacy and a space of your own while giving up some other things that people might think are hard to do without. So those are the things I think of as competitors in the space, right? Along, of course, with having six roommates and that whole kind of crazy thing. All right, uh, one relating to uh, criminal justice system. Uh, one of the main issues uh, when reintegrating formerly incarcerated individuals is um, the ability to have housing. Do you think that uh, this concept of pod sharing or a pod share like model would be a viable way of providing that transitional housing? Um, or do you see any pitfalls in looking at this method? Well, it's interesting because I think another, when we think about all the different streams that, that flow into each other or the, the big Venn diagram that we imagine, uh, transitional housing and group homes also have, let's say, a certain similarity to pod share housing other than that they tend not to be a voluntary arrangement for their residents. So I think there, that that already exists, right? That is community group housing. Um, and I, I think one of the things that's, that's interesting about that, uh, including from a theoretical level, is that ha so-called halfway houses, right? Transitional houses and group homes, are regarded as a less independent way of living where, the, where that is regarded as, in a sense, inferior, right? That, and that's, I think, is a whole, it's yet another kind of theoretical stream that feeds into this, which is the value of independent living as such. So the other, the other stream or piece of the Venn diagram that I would bring into this is, uh, assisted living, <coughs> assisted living for senior citizens, right? And the transition, right? When we think of young adults, right? Transitioning into independent ways of living, right? From parents' home to college dorm to first apartment. Then we have the end of life where there is a recognition of a need for additional services and support, right? These are things which place independent living at the center or at the apex, it's the paradigm, it's the ideal way of living. I think part of what pod share housing is, is at least meant to problematize is whether we should idealize maximally independent living or whether what that's really doing is making a virtue of a form of living so isolated that it actually isn't so good for people. So I think it's interesting to think about whether one could choose to live <clears throat> effectively for the rest of one's life or for a very extended time in an arrangement that might look to many of us like senior assisted living or a college dorm or a hostel or a halfway house, right? Whether there's a way to shift our frame so that that looks like a good thing instead of a bad thing. Now that's a separate issue from some concerns and questions that I have about pod share housing being privately operated as it is and whether there is sufficient protection for the people living there from a transient, potentially criminal population. That's one set of issues. Um, and a, another set of issues that we haven't touched upon yet is whether pod share housing uh, runs the risk of engaging in some of the same kinds of housing discrimination that we see elsewhere in housing, right? That is, we have ways of preventing a hotel from behaving in a discriminatory way may not always work perfectly, but we know what our civil rights framework is. Um, Airbnb, all those problems reappeared. I have some concerns that in pod share housing, it will reappear, right? That is, how do we decide who gets to stay here? Is it just anyone, right? We're in this weird gray area in between a hotel and an apartment that's being rented out to some somebody for a year at a time, right? Again, we know how to reach that 
through our civil rights laws. This is a little trickier. Um, so that there, there's a whole set of issues around that too, I think anti-discrimination in the, in the space. All right, I think we've got- We have, we have uh, final, Amanda? One final question, okay. I think, and then- Is that Tori Key's question? I can't hear you. We have a very first one that was submitted to us that we haven't got around to yet. Okay. Um, but he is wondering, is there a danger of posture housing growth making traditional housing more expensive. If landlords want to maximize income per square foot, uh, would they be investing more in project housing? And therefore, would there be even less supply of traditional apartments? Yes. Right, the answer is yes, right? That is, if this really takes off, it would threaten to do the very same thing that Airbnb has done, which is to reduce the available stock of housing, drive up the price of traditional housing, and increase inequality. That's right, right? That is, it is, that, it is an intervention that runs that risk for sure. That's the experiment that's being conducted by real estate developers who go this way instead of developing a traditional apartment building. And this, to the extent that this is happening in a relatively free market environment, uh, it's, it's a market that will decide, right? That is, so there, there are a number of these companies that have gone out of business, which creates all kinds of problems for their residents because they tend to be, um, for, for all of their, for, for all of, of their self-concept as a radical intervention, they typically are existing in a quite traditional lease and sublease situation. Um, and so when it all falls apart at one stage, suddenly everybody's evicted just the same. Um, that's got all kinds of problems. But yes, high density housing um, from a real estate developer's point of view is potentially so lucrative that it will drive lower density housing out of the market. That's right, right? And drive its prices up. And that's that's the the difficulty, right? How do we balance, you know, depending on how much of a commitment you have to a free market in real estate um, and in urban development, how how do we make the kinds of housing available that we want to have available. How do we make those decisions if we're going to do it any way other than a completely free market um, distribution of this resource? May I pose a final question? Is, is it the last question? I'd like to pose the last question Tori, from Tori Key. Is pot share housing just capitalizing, capitalizing on and gentrifying the shelter or temporary hotel living experiences that homeless people already undergo? Well, again, this is an interesting, an interesting question. Um, so one thing that I just want to, I want to say before we wrap up, it'll be part of, I assume it'll be part of the recording, you can keep it in or not, is I, I'm absolutely interested in an ongoing conversation with people who are having ideas about this. So I would ask that people not hesitate to either find me on Facebook um, where I am just by, by my regular first and last name, Diane Klein, uh, or not hesitate to email me at dianekline66 at gmail.com if you're interested in this subject. It's huge. Um, so that, that having been said, I think, yes, it, um, it is interesting to think about how this compares to shelter and transient environments. And I think it's, it's one of these situations where if you choose to be there and the amenities and other things that have been provided there are good enough, is, is this a difference, a difference of quantity that becomes a difference of quality? That is, if there's a different way to think about living under circumstances in which one has much less privacy, if you have opted into it, does that make all the difference? And I'm, I'm not enough of a of a small l liberal um, to think that anything people have freely chosen is is therefore insulated from any kind of critique, right? I I, I don't buy that, right? And yet there certainly is something to the idea that if you have if this is the way you have chosen to live you yourself will experience it differently than if you had no alternative but to live in this way. I mean, choice, uh, there's an illusion of choice, right? I mean, choice is, uh, is determined yeah. not by our free will, but by structural 
uh, questions and, and, and issues far outside our, our control. Yes, and, and this is part of what, what makes it so, so complicated, right? To think about whether, I mean, and that which really brings us back to, to the question which, with which I began, right? That is whether it's a critical intervention or merely a millennial fad um, and putting it another way, right? Is this just a tenement or a homeless shelter by another name? I, mm -hmm. Or alternatively, and I, I, I take this possibility seriously, even if in the end I end up rejecting it, I don't want to dismiss it out of hand. Are there genuinely different ways to think about privacy and intimacy and the it, it, materialism and acquisitiveness that increase the value of unplanned interactions? Mm -hmm. We will get on the other side of the medical risks that they pose, and we will think differently about those things again. Right? Are there virtues and values to that way of living that that we have devalued by mistake? Right? And if we were to restore their value, then maybe private, isolated ways of living would would not seem to us so obviously superior to less isolated ways of living, right? It, it really is about that value of privacy, which I think the current crisis is casting such a fascinating light on, right? Because being mm -hmm. able to isolate oneself, it, it now looks like a matter of life and death. Uh, Diane, Professor Klein, thank you again so much for your, your participation. All right, I think we're ready to resume. I would first like to give a special shout out to our sponsor for today's event, and especially for this next tax, uh, panel. The Minnesota Bar Association Tax Law Group has been a big supporter of the event and our next speaker. Um, and with that, I'll let Dr. Reed introduce him. Uh, Amanda, thank you for the, uh, the introduction. And again, as I said before the first panel, the, the first presentation, You've performed heroically under very, very trying circumstances, and, and I give you uh, my enormous appreciation, my, my admiration, my respect. You've done fantastic work. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Fabio, Fabio Ambrosio, uh, who is, comes to us from the University of Central Washington. He has spent time working in the Netherlands and Switzerland. He's experienced the, the uh, the extreme differences in social hierarchy and, and class in those places. And he comes to us with, with uh, dare I say, a world of, of experience. A world of experience. I, I would um, like to believe so. Uh, Fabio, please. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, today I'm going, I, I realize that we have some 109 uh, participants and, I, and I, um, I'm going to imagine uh, most of them are not tax lawyers. Uh, um, I suspect we have some students in there as well. Um, so I had prepared a PowerPoint presentation and then I went back given the audience and I added some more, I guess, background uh, material to, to, to add color. Uh, but I think some of this will contextualize what I'm about to talk um, about. I, I came to the United, uh, to United States in 2002 as an immigrant. I didn't speak any English whatsoever. Um, uh, my major, my undergraduate major was German literature. Um, and uh, obviously now I'm a tax professor that's taken a very uh, strange uh, road. I was, um, I fell in love with tax by accident. After I finished law school, I was uh, lucky to actually land the job of my dreams, which is I was legal counsel for an investment firm in Switzerland. And uh, I actually quite, uh, disliked working 80 hours a week and being tied to the to the blackberry uh blackberry yeah um and so but just through a random assignment uh i was asked to draft some tax memos tax memos that would essentially uh justify or explain why given investments were structured a certain way from a tax standpoint. And this made me fall in love with tax. And I think uh, I, I say this routinely uh, in my presentations that uh, tax is by far the love of my life uh, after my son. Um, and so it is true, it is everywhere. And in fact, just as we speak, um, there is a economic stimulus uh, bill being debated in Congress. 
Um, and you know, you might think, what does tax have to do with coronavirus? Well, the economic stimulus uh, happens by way of amending the Internal Revenue Code. And so one way or the other, everything has to revolve around taxes. And I'll just give you a funny story. I was just taking a Meprazole. This is for stomach acidity, heartburn. And on the back, it has some reference to taxes. And it's, it, it blows my mind how they're everywhere. They just follow me. So um, what I'm about to show you is um, something interesting that perhaps uh, not many of you have paid attention to. So I typically work and deal and study and write about federal taxes, for the most part, wealth taxes, estate and gift taxes. This is the first time that I delve into something more uh, local, like the sales tax. So I have a presentation. I'm going to uh, share my screen. I've done this many times before, so hopefully uh, technology works with me this time. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to try to do some fancy things, maybe some highlighting and things like that. Okay. So that's me. Uh, that is the title of my presentation. Um, we're going to talk about a study of special purpose local option sales taxes. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll know what they are and uh, how evil they can be as well. Um, okay, so first of all, what is my goal? Um, this is going to seem like uh, confusing, but we're starting with the end. So this is what I'm hoping to do. What I'm hoping to do is to connect the fact that the state of Washington partially funds criminal justice programs through a local sales tax surcharge. And the goal of my study is to observe whether funding criminal justice programs through this local sales tax surcharge is financially detrimental to certain counties. In other words, are all the counties getting an equal amount of money? And whether the quality of criminal justice programs is statistically associated with the amount of financing the counties derive. So for example, some, somehow we'd have to measure quality and somehow we'd have to tie the quality with the money that the counties are receiving through the local sales tax charge and then see, do the counties that get less money, uh, is, is the quality of the criminal justice program sometime, uh, somehow impacted? Um, so, but before we, we get to the end, which is how I started, that's the aim of the study, let's step back and I'm going to paint a color of how this all fits in the big scheme of things. So I'm a history nerd, uh, besides a tax nerd, and uh, one of the uh, figures in history that I think um, most of us don't know for his true quality is Casanova. Casanova is uh, famous for his quality as a as a Latin lover, but in reality, he was a, a great philosopher and he left it with, uh, with six volumes uh, called The Story of My Life. He had um, he, the last 10 years of his life, he spent it as a librarian and he basically jotted down every single bit of memory he had from his life. You might not know that virtually anything that we know about um, a Venetian, uh, culture and lifestyle from the 1700s comes from Casanova. Casanova spent the last 10 years of his life writing down anything and everything that crossed his mind, every bit of memory, even the types of cookies that he liked and which bakery made them. Uh, and so we have a wealth of things that we know from Casanova. Casanova uh, has an incredible life. Um, he uh, was the son of an actress, which at the time was not a very uh, was, was not a very prestigious job. Actress was, a, um, was not what we think of today. Um, and, um, but Casanova managed to basically lift himself. I won't tell you his life story, but it's quite fascinating. So he had an exchange with K King Frederick the Great of Prussia. Uh, he also met King, uh, Louis XIV. Uh, again, he, he managed to enter the circles of Madame de Pompadour and, and lots of influential people despite being a commoner. So I'm going to show you a dialogue that Casanova had with King Frederick the Great around 1750. Here's what King Frederick asks Casanova. Give me your opinions on taxation. And he said, there are three kinds of taxes considered as to their effects. The first is ruinous, the second a necessary evil, and the third invariably beneficial. The ruinous impost is the royal tax, the necessary is the military, and the beneficial is the popular. The royal tax, sire, is that which deplenishes the purses of the subjects to fill the coffers of the king. This is a rather remarkable, I mean, think about what he's saying. He's saying this to a king. He's telling a king that whatever taxes he takes for his own benefit is a ruinous tax. 
And the king says, and that, that kind of tax is always ruinous, you think? And Casanova says, always, sire. It prevents the circulation of money, the soul of commerce, and the mainstay of the state. King says, but if the tax to be levied, to keep, but if the tax to be levied to keep up the strength of the army, you say it is a necessary evil. Yes, it is necessary and yet evil, for war is an evil. Quite so. Now, how about the popular tax? This is always a benefit, for the monarch takes with one hand and gives with the other. He improves towns and roads, founds schools, protects the sciences, cherishes the art. In fine, he directs this tax towards improving the condition and increasing the happiness of his people. There's a good deal of truth in that. I suppose you know Calsabigi. Calsabigi was a statistician at the time. And Casanova said, I ought to, Your Majesty, as E and I established the general lottery of Paris seven years ago. Now, you might not know that Casanova is actually attributed to be the inventor of the lottery system. Uh, there is some speculation that actually Calsabigi was the statistician that did the math and Casanova stole it and made it his. But Casanova sold the lottery system to King Louis XIV. Um, and so he became extremely rich because King Louis XIV at the time where, you know, the, uh, the, the people were quite discontent, um, were happy with the, with the lottery, with the chance to become rich overnight. So King, the King Frederick says here, in what class would you put this taxation? I'm going to offer some reflections when I'm done reading this. For you will agree it is a taxation of a kind. We're talking about the lottery. Certainly, sire and not the least important. It is beneficial when the monarch spends his profits for the good of the people, but the monarch may lose once in 50. Is that conclusion the result of mathematical calculation? Yes, sire. I find this uh, dialogue so enlightening for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, just the thought process, Casanova describes taxes by their effects, not by what we are taxing, but by what they do. He understands that a tax that prevents the circulation of money is detrimental to the economy. He understands that funding war is necessary. And for those of you that don't know, military spending makes up the vast majority of what the federal government spends. And um, he also understands that the government or the king in this way directs the social decides the social direction that the country is going to take in terms of where it spends the money. This is government spending. Government spending is a major driver of the economy. So he understood that too. He also understood that the lottery is indeed a tax. And I bet most of you don't think of the lottery as a tax. But some of what we're going to talk about does tie with the lottery. And the reason why it does tie with the lottery is because people don't think of the lottery as a tax, yet it is. And it's, this is called an invisible tax. Research has shown that people are more prone to accept politically as well as financially a tax that is considered to be invisible and voluntary. And so people choose to pay it and they also don't notice that they're paying a tax. So I, I personally find this, this dialogue so um, amazing because you know it's 300 years ago or so and yet it is so uh, current. Now, I'm going to go into what my study is about, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, you find it interesting and offer some ideas or thoughts. Um, so first of all, for those of that are not familiar, I've added this slide for those that are not familiar with how tax system work, some words that we're going to use. A lot of us, when we talk about tax, we think about the rate. But in reality, there is so much more to a tax system. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the base. The base is what we tax. So a tax rate of 20% on personal income is very different from a tax rate of 20% on the sale of cigarettes because there is much more personal income than there is volume from the sale of cigarettes. So there is typically an inversely proportional relationship between the size of the base and the size of the rate. The bigger the base, the bigger is what you're taxing, the less you really need to tax in terms of percentage. Then we typically have a system of preferences. Preferences understood as credits, deductions, things that we encourage people to do. For example, we might decide to tax income, we might decide to tax income at 20%, but for some reason we decide to tax certain types of income less or none at all. Then we have a mechanism of administration, 
you can think of it in, in the United States as the IRS, and then just like all administrative functions, we have an opportunity to appeal. So that's how the, the pieces fit together. So in the United States, I, again, for those of us that are not uh, uh, US taxpayers or not familiar, generally speaking, there are a million exceptions as the law knows well, generally speaking, the income tax, the tax on income is imposed by the federal government and the state government. Sometimes counties and cities also have income taxes, but it's less, less common. The sales tax is not imposed by the federal government. It is imposed by state governments and county governments, sometimes also by the city, but typically it's the state and county tax. The property tax is typically imposed by the county only. And then we have a bunch of utility tax user fees that are imposed by city and county governments. So this is what we know as um, local, local. So when we say local taxes, we're referring to taxes that are imposed by county and city governments. This would be state. And so for if any, if we have any SALT um, people on, on Zoom right now, SALT stands for uh, state and local tax, state and local tax, meaning any kind of tax that is imposed by these jurisdictions um, below the federal government. All right, so now let me uh, move on to what the issue is. The issue is that under these four presidents, and uh, I would dare say mostly him, President Reagan, um, the, um, the property tax has become extremely unpopular. So historically, the property tax made up the vast majority of uh, highlighter, where is it? Okay, there you go. Historically, the property tax has been the most important source of local government revenue. In other words, the way things used to work is if I live in Seattle, Washington, the county of King would impose property taxes on the value of the home that I own. That money would go straight into the county of King, which would then spend it on things in the county of King. Think of, for example, school districts, right? So there was a connection between those who pay the tax and those who consume the goods that are paid with the tax. In this case, that's called, um, I believe it's a congruence or something like that. But it's basically where those who are paying the tax are the same people that are enjoying the benefit of the tax and the things that are paid with the tax. That's how it used to work. But in the 70s, we, st we started this phenomenon called tax revolt, where the property tax became extremely unpopular. And so we have seen in the last, in the last 40 years, a struggle by local governments to make up um, the lost property tax revenue. There have been countrywide massive uh, initiatives to uh, reduce or eliminate the property tax or to cap increases in the property tax. And of course, local governments have had to make up the difference somehow. And so we have had an increase nationwide, but some states more than others, an increase in other ways to raise local revenue. And so that's been made up mostly by the sales tax, local income tax, lotteries, like we saw, as well as fees for public services. Maybe some of you have noticed that now you pay, say, uh, fees on your um, utility poles on your, uh, you know, for cell phones or water. Uh, you also pay user fees for certain public parks, county, county parks, and uh, things like that. Um, this is called revenue portfolio theory, which kind of, you know, makes sense. In essence, this is kind of what we all do with our finances. If we all do with our finances, we should diversify our revenue portfolio. So if we have less income or less money from one source, we should make up with money from another source. So it's, it's not really uh, rocket science. Southern states and these ones have spearhead, spearheaded the effort to basically move away from the property tax in favor of other taxes, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia. And in fact, most studies on the property tax revolt pertain to uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia counties, as, as you're about to see. And so these states have, gener have generated the, the initial knowledge on what happens when we move away from the property tax. So uh, this is just a funny cartoon from 1914 on tax bases, essentially arguing tax in. If, if you see, these are all tax bases. These are all things that we could potentially tax, beer, 
uh, motion pictures, income, whiskey, playing cards, and they're all saying, tax him, tax him, don't tax me. In this case, we're having basically the property tax, you know, the value of the home say, don't tax me, tax something else and tax the sale of goods. Um, again, this is a cartoon for 1914. Now, along with the property tax revolt, something else has been happening, which is uh, a phenomenon called devolution. And the devolution is different from decentralization. Decentralization simply decentralizes the administration of things, but not the financing of things. So under a system, under a decentralized system, the financing comes from the central government, but the administration comes from local governments. So a decentralized system would be a system where, say, the federal government provides financing for police, say, but it's the counties and the states and the cities that actually administer that money and that function. That's decentralization. Devolution is different. Devolution is where you have a higher government, federal government, state government, mandate that local governments should provide some services, but without actually providing any money for it. So this, the devolution happens where the federal government says, you states, you counties must meet these targets in public education, but there is no money for you. So the local governments have not only to meet the target, but they also have to provide uh, somehow find the financing to actually run these programs. So that is what devolution is. So local governments in the United States typically employ 45% of general fund revenue, for those of you who don't know what general fund revenue, that means anything that is not earmarked for a specific purpose. So to provide police and safety related services, which in many other countries other than the United States are actually funded by the central government. So in the United States, typically you would have a county or a city basically employing half of its money to pay for firefighters, police, and things like that, um, half of that. Uh, where, whereas in other countries that comes from the central government. So we have this phenomenon of devolution. So a study in 1989 um, looked at 757 municipalities across 46 statistical metropolitan areas. Statistical metropolitan areas are, I believe, defined by the Bureau of Labor, uh, Labor Statistics. And they're basically metro areas with uh, surrounding areas. And these, this study has found that there was a rapid expansion in the number of social services offered by local governments during the mid 1970s. This is in line with the devolution because the devolution has basically done a couple of things. It has said no to the property tax. And on top of that, it has devolved, it has mandated the furnishing of services without money or without most of the money from the central government. And so this study essentially found what we, were, we would expect, that is, there was a surge in social services offered by local governments. The study also found that the package of public services provided by local governments is relatively standardized, which makes sense, right? I mean, no matter how big or how small a county or city is, you will still expect them to have fire stations, you know, police officers to take care of roads. Uh, so some, you know, some cities will have more parks, but generally you would have a standard package of services. What is different is the way that local governments finance those services. And this is kind of where we are uh, with the rest of the, um, of the presentation. So the way the local governments finance these services is different. So let's see what has made nationwide and in some states more than others, the sales tax so popular. The sales tax is a lot like the lottery. The sales tax has become increasingly popular because it is invisible. And this phenomenon is the theory of fiscal illusion. The theory of fiscal illusion is the same thing that makes people fall for the lottery because they don't see it. So you don't essentially see that you're paying the tax. It's invisible. The sales tax also is particularly uh, interesting because the base, what we tax is spatially mobile. If you think about what we tax in a sales tax system, we tax spending. And spending is not necessarily done by the people that live where the services are needed. For example, if I live in Seattle, Seattle has lots of shopping opportunities. I could very well, and not, not could, but I do have a lot of people living in the surrounding areas that come to Seattle to shop. And that basically the base, their, their spendable income comes here and feeds the coffers of the city of Seattle and the county of King. 
So that makes the base, the thing that we tax, spatially mobile, and it allows localities that have market dominance or that have more opportunities for shopping to basically steal revenue, so to speak, from other, other localities. So that has triggered tax competition. The other thing that studies have found that is quite interesting is that taxpayers favor proposals that shift the tax incidence of services they consume to someone else. That's a theory of tax incidence. In other words, I want my son's school to be a great school, but if I can find a way for Dr. Reed to pay for it, I'm, I'm cool with that, <laughs> right? I just want a school to be great. I don't necessarily want to pay for it. So taxpayers actually favor measures that allow them to shift the cost of what they consume to someone else. And the, at last, the sales tax is low salience. And by salience, we are talking about the degree of consumer response to a tax change for reasons other than the net tax liability. So let me explain what that means. That means that if I up the sales tax on lettuce from eight to eight and a half percent, research has shown that people don't suddenly consume less lettuce. In other words, the demand for goods is fairly inelastic with respect to the tax. And that is particularly true for primary goods. In other words, ironically, you could tax bread and water and lettuce and cereal a lot more than you could tax Ferraris because the demand for luxury goods is more elastic and responds more to a change in price due to an increase in tax. But as the demand for primary goods is fairly stable, it's inelastic, then any change in sales tax has less salience, causes less of a response or decrease in, in demand. Uh, and so basically it has created a free for all increase in sales tax, especially on primary goods. So this is an example. I've actually, uh, I have a book that uh, will come out this fall and I've stolen some uh, exhibits from the book. Uh, this is something that is included in the book and it shows how the sales tax is regressive. We hear this a lot. The sales tax is regressive, but some people don't really understand how it is regressive. Regressive means that as your income increases, you pay less proportionally. That's what regressive means. Now, if you think of a politician, no politician would go very far by just outspokenly go out there and say, yeah, um, I'm going to decrease tax rates as income increases. That's not going to be a very popular move, but you can do that invisibly. So consider here the impact of a $60 sales tax on bread over the course of the year. So what I have done here is I have figured a person, regardless of whether that person is Bill Gates or me or a homeless person, can only eat so much bread. You may love bread, but you, you know you can't. It's not because you're Bill Gates you can suddenly eat 65 billion pounds of bread in a year. So your consumption is really just about there. But the impact, and, and, and also on paper, you're all paying the same sales tax on the bread. So whether Bill Gates or I eat 20 pounds of bread in a year, we're both gonna pay the same amount of sales tax. So with respect to the price of the bread, the sales tax is flat and it looks like it's indiscriminatory. But with respect to our incomes, the sales tax is regressive because the incidence of that $60 sales tax on my income is a lot higher than it is on Bill Gates' income. And you know, of course, it's going to be a lot higher uh, on, on the homeless person. So what you see here is essentially this $60 sales tax over the course of the year paid on bread and the incidence that that has proportional to income, whether a taxpayer has a $2,000 income or a $60,000 income. So for the $2,000 income taxpayer, that would be a 6% hit. And for the $70,000 taxpayer, that would be a 0.09%. This is why the sales tax is regressive because the impact on your income as you consume, you can only consume so much of primary goods, um, is proportionally less as your income increases. So now what's happened in the last 40 years, remember what well, the issue is that um, voter, voters, especially in Southern states, have uh, moved away from the property tax. We also said that localities provide the same package of services. So bottom line is how, how else are we going to pay for this now that we don't have the property tax revenue? And so what you see here is the green is, the comp, is basically the addition of 
the sales tax that is added by cities and counties. The blue is what is imposed by the state. The green is what is the local option sales tax. In other words, the surcharge that counties and cities have the option to add on top of the state rate. That's called the local option sales tax. So um, local option sales tax, research has shown, are adopted according to fiscal stress, in other words, need, right? If you need it, you impose it, as well as the capacity to explore the tax. In other words, if you are a regional market dominant area, you would impose a higher tax. Why? Because you can. Because you know people must come there to shop. Because you know that the neighboring city doesn't have any large supermarkets. You know that this is where the Costco is. <laughs> you know that the shopping is going to happen here. So whether they like it or not, this competition can be a competition of I'm alluring shoppers here, or it could simply be they must come here because they have no choice. They are in a rural area with no or limited shopping opportunities. So a study found that regional market dominance is directly related to retail sales per capita. Makes sense, right? Regional market dominance, and there is no standard definition for regional market dominance. This is kind of makes for an interesting side topic. But remember, these studies that I'm looking at, for the most part, are studies from the 80s and 90s. And they used to understand regional market dominance to be uh, a function of retail surface space. Now we all know in the era of online shopping that retail surface space is no longer a good indicator of regional market dominance because a lot of shopping happens online. And so this is, I guess, one of the challenging that I'm, challenges that I'm facing with is that it used to be much easier to see you know, which county or which city has the most shops and the highest retail surface space. But now that's not so much an indicator of regional market dominance. And another study also found that, or the same study also found that bordering low tax jurisdictions create a bordered effect of tax competition. I believe, I believe the study found that essentially when you are within 12 miles proximity from a jurisdiction that has a better tax rate or no sales tax at all, people are more likely to go shop there. So 12 miles seems to be the magic distance where the neighboring jurisdiction is going to steal away, steal away your, your sales tax revenue. So um, going back to, I'm actually going to, um, uh, sorry, go to this. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, this has nothing to do with sales tax, but I, but I, I want to offer this again. This comes from the book. Um, what we have here is the sources of income at the federal level. So we're stepping away from the sales tax for a moment. But what I want to show you here is that before the Great Depression, um, the um, orange here is the salaries and wages. In other words, this is an indication of people who essentially worked for someone else. The blue here is an indication of self-employment income. And so what you see here is that leading up to the Great Depression, people essentially left jobs and started to be more self-employed. And so into the Great Depression, we actually had a super high level of self-employment compared to um, people that were employees, uh, workers for someone else. And then we have the Great Depression and you see that reverse massively. And then um, wages, employed individuals have remained fairly high ever since. And self-employment never quite came up to the pre-depression rates. Um, the reason I'm showing you this is because historical events sometimes have a trailing effect, sometimes a very long trailing effect. And I think what we are witnessing with the property tax and the sales tax is, a, is something that is going to trail with us for many decades. In other words, for many decades in the future, we are going to look at a property tax that is going to remain either steady or decrease and the sales tax that is going to e increase steadily. So I think we are kind of at the, at the beginning of a major trend like this, albeit in an entirely different scenario. All right, so now let's look at Washington and why I'm looking at Washington. First, I live here and I love it here. Uh, second, <laughs> um, the state of Washington is particularly unique because we talked about revenue diversification and portfolio. Well, in Washington, the state income tax is unconstitutional under the state constitution. So the state of Washington has never had a state income tax, which puts pressure to levy revenue from other sources. Also, in, for purposes of um, 
uh, of a time series analysis, I can go back in history as far as I want, and I never have to control for the impact of a state income tax. We never had one. So in that respect, it makes for a good place. Second, uh, some Washington counties border Oregon, which offer that competition effect, as well as a little bit on this side, Montana is fairly close. And the third main reason why Washington makes for a really good study is what you are about to see. I'm not going to spoil that, but it's coming in a slide or two. So let me show you an example of how um, the city of Seattle sales tax rate is made up of. We have a six and a half percent state um, portion. We have a three and a half percent County of King, which is where Seattle is located. And then we have a 0.1% city of Seattle sales tax that makes up the 10.1%. Now, again, remember state of Washington has never had an income tax. Property tax revolt means that we're moving away from the property tax. So in a sense, you can't really blame, you know, government, state and local government officials to push for the sales tax because they don't really have a whole lot of other options. Uh, that we recently had a Washington initiative 1634. And the purpose of Washington Initiative 1634 basically was no more of the red. We don't want cities to impose any addition anymore to the sales tax that is already too high. Now, the measure did pass, which basically means that cities can now not impose any additional sales tax on um, grocery items. The measure was specific to grocery items. What's really interesting is look at the spending for the campaign. The yes campaign, in other words, prohibit any further increases to the sales tax on grocery items, spent 22 million and the no campaign spent $125,000. That was a 180 times more. And the yes campaign was financed by the Coca-Cola company, Pepsi and Dr. Pepper and so on. You can see it yourself. The no campaign was, was financed by Healthy Kids Coalition. If you think about what this means, the no campaign was essentially saying, yeah, let sales tax rates go higher on grocery items. Yes. Um, Anyway, so let's go back to uh, this. We're zooming in now to what the study is, and I hope I'm not boring you all. Uh, but um, lost is the local option sales tax. Lost is essentially the green part of this bar chart, the optional surcharge to the state rate that counties and cities can charge. Now, lost is tax that goes into the general fund, the general tax revenue of cities and counties that they can spend it any way they want. Remember about 45% of that is for public safety services. Now, if that tax is specifically earmarked for a special purpose, then that lost is known as a special purpose local option sales tax. A special purpose local option sales tax is essentially a portion of this green that is earmarked for a specific need at the local government level, county and city. So what's really interesting about special purpose local option sales taxes is that out of southern states, remember Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia have been the first ones to move away from the property tax. They have been the first ones to move in favor of the sales tax. And they've also been the first ones to earmark a portion of the local sales tax for special purposes. So Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia have tried to finance public schools through a special purpose local option sales tax surcharge. And California has actually tried to finance public roads. So the issue with this is we go back to, I want a great school for my son, but I want Dr. Reed to pay for it. That's essentially what Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia have tried to do. They have moved away from the property tax. The property tax is essentially what provided the revenue for the school for the kids that lived in the neighborhood. And the sales tax now allows that neighborhood to leverage the spatially mobile base that comes from shoppers in other places. Now that also means that if Dr. Reed lives in a rural area and comes shop in my local jurisdiction, not only his money is going to pay for my son's school, but his money is not going to pay for his son's school because whatever spending he does here, he doesn't do where he lives. And so not only that brings more money for my son's school, but he takes away money from his school. So there is this influx of revenue away from the rural areas and into the urban and semi-urban areas. Um, so this gives us reason three why Washington is so unique. 
Other states have used this system to finance, for the most part, public education. That's been the, the model. The model has been, let's use social, um, special purpose local option sales taxes for public education. The state of Washington is the first and the only one in the union that actually uses this special purpose local option sales tax not to finance education or transportation, but to finance local criminal justice needs. This includes jails, juvenile detention facilities, re rehabilitation centers, public safety services, and large. So the state of Washington is essentially tying a portion of the local sales tax surcharge earmarked that for local safety needs. Okay, so uh, what we have here is uh, some signs. Uh, maybe some of you have seen these, but these are all kind of signs you may have seen in your neighborhood uh, in favor of or against uh, special purpose local option sales taxes, uh, SPLOST, yes to SPLOST, uh, vote yes for property tax relief. Um, the limited literature to this date has focused on the correlation between the special purpose local option sales tax and public education financing, which makes sense, right? Because if you think about states that have used this model, for the most part, the states have used this model to finance public education. So the, the, the studies that we have have looked at, for the most part, Tennessee, Georgia, and North Carolina, and for the most part, as to whether the using the special purpose local option sales tax is discriminatory with respect to public education and more specifically with respect to uh, schools in rural areas. Um, studies have found, not surprisingly, that special purpose local option sales tax is a suboptimal method of financing critical government services because the sales tax flows unevenly. And so, for example, it has been shown that special purpose local option sales tax tied to education exacerbate inequalities among counties to the detriment of rural communities. I'm going to show you just one of these. There are about two dozen of these studies, but this is a 1991 Tennessee study. What we have here is a local sales tax revenue per $1,000 of personal income. What we have is urban, semi-urban, semi-rural, and rural. So what we have is essentially the sales tax revenue, as you can see, is higher for urban or semi-urban and lower for rural. What we have here in figure two is the sales tax capacity. And that is measured by, at the time, uh, basically how much revenue we could raise per pupil. And that is a function of essentially the retail surface base, as well as the income of the people that live there or around there. So not surprisingly, the city areas is where most of the sales tax revenue capacity is. The last figure shows the per pupil sales tax revenue compared to the state average. Now this is important to actually visualize, visualize it this way. What we're saying is that the state average is here. This is one, 100% state average, okay? What we're saying is this is how much revenue goes per student. If your student in a, is in a semi-urban non-metro or in a, if your student is in a metro area. So if my student is in the Nashville metro area, my student is being spent $137. If my student is in a rural area, my student is being spent $51. So there's $51 of financing that goes for my student. So it's, quite, it's a 300% you know, almost difference. Um, now remember, these are state schools, state schools subject to the same objective, state, same curriculum. So these kids supposedly have to all meet the same goal. And yet, one child is basically being provided three times the resources of another child, and those resources are more towards metro, semi-metro, and away from rural. So in an ideal world, if this was financed through the property tax, what you would expect is a flat, flat amount. Or if this was financed at the central level by the state, this would be a flat amount. But because it's been locally financed, then you have this influx towards uh, rural. So what my study hopes to do um, is essentially this. What I want to know is, is there an unequal flow of special purpose local option sales tax revenue across jurisdictions in the, sp in the state? I would expect yes, right? Just like all other studies, I would expect the revenue to not be ev evenly distributed. Two, in jurisdictions where the revenue results in a negative spillover. Negative spillover essentially means that what I have is, say, a sales tax rate of 10% in county Y. And 
the income of people that live in County Y is $100,000. So if those people spend all their income, I should have $10,000 of revenue. If I have less than 10,000, what I have is a negative spillover. That means that that money went somewhere else. So if that happens to a county, if a county is collecting less than it should or less than it could, are there compensatory forms of funding criminal justice programs? Remember, this is where we're looking at the earmarked portion of the local sales tax earmarked for criminal justice programs. So if you are not able to get the money you need from this tax, are you getting from, from somewhere else? Are you making it up somewhere else? Does the state give you more money? Does the federal government give you more money? Or are you simply providing less quality services? That's, I guess, what my question is. Next, do non-market dominant counties feature a more diversified revenue portfolio? In other words, if you're not market dominant, market dominant means you can hit on the shopping. If you're not that, then I would expect that you try to raise revenues in some other way. For example, if you're a rural county, maybe you're really trying to leverage the local user fees, the park fees, the lottery, or something else, because you know you can't use the sales tax, you can't use the income tax, the property tax is unpopular, how else are you going to run? Um, and then um, in counties where there is a meaningful tax spillover, so in other words, whether counties are collecting more than they should, or whether counties are collecting less than they should, is there a relationship between the sales tax and the quality. In other words, can we say that counties that are collecting more, that has an impact on the quality of the services that are providing? And then at last, what could be done to equalize? Um, you know, this uh, state, I mentioned Tennessee and North Carolina and, um, and Georgia, um, there are a number of things you can do to mitigate the impact. And, and I'm about to show you what the state of Washington does. Um, on the extreme, you can say, you county or king, whatever money you raise, you keep. But what most systems do is they require the county to share a portion of that revenue with the state, which is then a portion with all counties and cities based on population. That has a mitigating effect on this discriminatory impact of the local option sales tax. So um, I'm not sure if I have more time, but now I've basically told you what the study is about. Now I have slides that tell you how far into it I am and what I have found so far. So am I good on time? Yeah? Okay. All right, so let me show you what, what I have. This is how, these are the details of the Washington Special Purpose Local Option Sales Tax for Criminal Justice Program. So you can see, you know, we're, we're, we're lawyers and so the details, the devil is in the details. Um, there are three variants of the special purpose local option sales tax that the state of Washington allows. The first one is for all counties. No vote is needed, but it is subject to repeal by referendum. The rate of that first option is 0.1%. It is 100% earmarked for the intended purpose. And the county only gets to keep 10% of that, and 90% of that is allocated to the cities based on population. So it stays 100% in the county, but not 100% in the county coffers. I'm going to go to the last row in a minute. The second, we have two variants, one at the county level and one at the city level. At the county level, the county can raise the sales tax by as much as 0.3%. At the city level, the city can raise it by as much as 0.1%. In order to pass it in both cases, the city must have a vote and it must pass by majority vote. The county must have a vote and must pass by a majority vote. For the county option, the county retains 60% of that and 40% is divided among the cities based on population within the county. For the city option, the city retains 85% of that and 15% goes back to the counties. This is what the mitigating system, how the mitigating system works. The last option, is available only with counties that have populations of less than a million. And in Washington, that is basically every county has less than a million people other than King County, which is where Seattle is. So basically this option is available for all counties other than King County. This option allows the county to raise the sales tax by as much as 0.1%. 100% of that sales tax has to be used for the intended purpose and there is no revenue sharing. Now, in terms of the intended purposes, they're written down here. As you see, option one, two, and three, they all have the same description. 
activities to substantially assist the criminal justice system, which may include circumstances where ancillary benefit to the civil justice system occurs, which includes domestic violence services, such as those provided by domestic violence programs, community advocates, and legal advocates. And the first three all have the same intended purpose. The last one is specifically earmarked for the costs associated with financing, design, acquisition, construction, equipment, operating, blah, 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 of juvenile detention facilities and jails. So this is kind of what makes the study difficult. What makes the study difficult is essentially this, or I should say maybe a couple of things, and this is where I could really use your thoughts. First part is, remember, sales don't happen like the 90s anymore where people go and shop. A lot of it happens online. So somehow I have to capture that ability to export revenue. In other words, has the internet leveled the playing field between a rural county and a market dominant county? Two, um, not all of the tax levied actually stays in the jurisdiction that has collected that sales, that, that tax. And three, the uh, tax is earmarked for fairly broad services. So somehow, if I want to tie it to quality, I'd have to somehow exactly find out where this money is going. As you can see, the, the purpose is quite wide. Um, so it's, it's, if, if, if it said something like, you know, for police services, and then I could just look at police spending, I could just look at, you know, police staffing, but it's so broad that somehow I have to capture, okay, what do we mean by quality of criminal justice programs, given this very broad definition of where the money is going. Uh, much easier here where, you know, the earmark purpose is very specific to juvenile detention facilities and jails. Here I could look at more specific things like, say, staff per inmate, uh, square footage per inmate, uh, exit surveys of quality of meals, uh, availability of hospital care, and those kinds of things that are indicative of quality of services at the juvenile detention facility level. Um, so this is a breakdown of Washington counties and whether they are using these three options. Remember, we have three options at the county level. Option one is a 0.1% Option two is a 0.3% and option three is a 0.1% for juvenile detention facilities. So there are some counties like Benton County, for example, that are adopting all five or all three of them. The maximum would be 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.1 and 0.5% special purpose local option sales tax for criminal justice programs at large. There are some counties like Asseton County that don't adopt any of them. And there are some counties, almost all of them, as you can see, adopt the first one. Why the first one? Because the first one is the only one that doesn't require a vote. Okay, remember raising sales tax is an extremely unpop unpopular uh, initiative in Washington right now. So that's why option one is particularly, uh, particularly relevant. So I have mapped uh, this and what you see here is basically the 0 0.1 means that the county adopts at least one of the three special purpose local option sales taxes. 0 0.5 means that the county adopts all three special purpose local option sales taxes. And the gray means that the county has not adopted any of the special purpose local option sales taxes. So you, you can see which counties have been the most aggressive in leveraging the additional sales tax potential by raising the sales tax um, rates. So what I have done next, and again, you know, what, what I want to emphasize is that this is, uh, I'm envisioning this to take me another year, year and a half, because, you know, I, this is what I do with my free time. You know, other people go on hikes and stuff. This is what I do. Um, and so, um, you know, my hope is that by July that I will have some kind of preliminary findings paper, but I really think it's going to take me probably a year and a half to collect the data and, you know, regress it in a way that it might tell us what, um, what we're trying to find out. But just, just as an attempt, what I have done is I've tried to see, I've tried to use the traditional model of market dominance. And so in this particular case, you know, definition is very important. In this particular case, I have defined market dominance as a dichotomous variable. You either are market dominant or you're not. And the counties that collect more than 120% of statewide average sales tax per capita in this case, I have determined them to be market dominant. In other words, if the average sales tax collected per capita statewide is $100 and you're collecting 130, that is more than 125% above the state average, that means you're market dominant. Somehow, whether through the internet or through retail sales on the floor, you're collecting more. And I like this 
approach because it moves away from retail surface space, which has become less relevant with online sales. So these are the market dominant counties based on this working definition. Now, the next thing I have done is I have looked at where would, you know, remember what the purpose of the special purpose local option sales tax is, is to augment financing for criminal justice programs, juvenile detention facilities, rehab programs, advocate services, domestic violence programs, and so on. I've tried to see where is the need for those services somehow. This is, you know, kind of the harder part. In this case, just for this particular case, um, again, not, not a bulletproof definition, but this is what I have done so far. Again, dichotomous variable, are you in high need or are you not in high need? Counties are labeled high need if they meet at least one of the following three criteria. A total crime rate of 125% of the statewide average. The incidence of violent crimes in the county is higher than 150% of statewide average or the county is home to one of 12 prison facilities run, not by the federal government, because those are funded by federal funds, by, by the Washington State Department of Corrections. So based on this working definition, those are the high need counties. Then what I have tried to do is I've tried to overlap the need with the flow. And so the blue is the flow of the sales tax and the red is the need. And as you can see, visually, there is not a match of where the money's going and where the need is. Now, a lot of this is you know, definitional because of course, as we change the definition of need, as we change the definition of dominance, the colors change. But again, this is an exercise that I have done just to prepare for the conference. I think visuals are good in terms of giving you a picture of what I'm trying to accomplish with the study. And so in this case, if my working definitions were to be what you know I decide to keep, which I doubt, but for now, I could say, well, look, this model is working only for Skagit County. Skagit County is the only place that actually where the, this model is working, where the money is going, where the need is. In all other places, the money is going somewhere other than where the need is, which is actually in line with all the other studies that have come out for public education from Tennessee, Georgia, and, um, and North Carolina. Um, all right, so that's what I have. Um, now, this is a bibliography that, you know, for those of you who want to read more about where I got all this stuff from. Um, and then uh, at last, I am going to take any questions. All right, hopefully that wasn't too much. No, that was great. And the PowerPoint is very helpful. Um, we've got three questions so far. Um, the first is when someone makes a purchase online, how do you determine which jurisdiction's tax system applies? Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and can I ask you to repeat the question? Yes, uh, when someone makes a purchase online, how do you determine which jurisdiction's tax system applies? Uh, well, that's actually an interesting uh, um, uh, topic. That has to do with whether the person that makes the purchase as well as the seller live in what's called an origin-based jurisdiction or a destination-based jurisdiction. So this may have happened to those that are in attendance. Back in the days, maybe not so long ago, six, seven years ago, you used to buy things on Amazon or eBay, and sometimes they wouldn't charge you sales tax, and you couldn't understand why. Um, and that's because over time, um, essentially, if you were in a place called an origin-based uh, system, which I think only New Mexico is left as origin based system. It means that you pay sales tax there where the sale happens. So if you are in an origin based state and you're making a purchase in a state that has no sales tax, I'm in origin based New Mexico and I make a purchase from, or a purchase from Oregon or New Hampshire and in Oregon there is no sales tax, the seller is not going to charge me sales tax. I'm not going to pay sales tax. So that's the way it used to work. Now states have come together and are plotting against us to make sure that doesn't happen anymore. And I would challenge, I bet any of you that have made any purchase online in the last three years who live in a state that has sales tax, you'll see no matter where you buy things from, you're being charged sales tax, eBay, Amazon. That's partly a function of SUTA, the, sales, the Streamlined Sales and Use Tax Agreement. So tax, states are basically working together to make sure that at least one state is charging the tax. Uh, and typically the state that is charging the tax is the state where the resident, where the goods are being shipped. And so if you, you know, live in Minnesota and you're having goods shipped in Minnesota, then the sales tax that the seller will impose is the sales tax of where the goods are being shipped and more specifically of the locality where you live. So for the most part, the answer to that question is where you live and where the goods are shipped. Amanda, may, 
Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can I hear pose you. Uh, and can I hear you? Can you speak? Yep. Oh, wonderful. We're, we're connected. Uh, I have two questions to pose. One of a um, uh, of very different proportions. Okay. Uh, one small, one very large. The small question is this, and it's not a small question, but it, it, it's it's very different from the other one I'm going to post. Uh, mass incarceration is a major issue right now nationally. Are these very great differences in um, in tax rates having an impact? On incarceration rates or the development of creative alternatives to incarceration, the creative, al uh, creative alternatives to providing low cost means of criminal justice. That's question one. That's the, that, the other question is uh, a, uh, the, the, uh, the macro question, if you will, and that's the question of inequality. And I'll draw everyone's attention to a, a Supreme Court decision from 1975. Rodriguez versus San Antonio School District. It was, um, and I'll call attention particularly to the dissent in that case. It involved local school funding. The dissent in that case, and, and it and it held con for constitutional purposes, local school funding could be handled locally. the The question that was presented was whether this led to inequality of economic opportunity. Justice Thurgood Marshall wrote a compelling dissent in that case, arguing that um, wealth should be seen as a suspect category and should be in these sorts of local arrangements with these very great disparities uh, should in fact be constitutionally suspect. So two questions, incarceration and the constitutionality of it all. Yeah, so on the incarceration, um, I don't, I mean, I, I don't think the, uh, I mean, of course, you know, as, as you know, in, in research, we don't typically answer cause and effect, you know, we just look at uh, correlation. So, but just my own speculation, I don't think the sales tax rate is having an impact on the incarceration. What I think the incarceration is doing is it is impacting the quality of whatever services are provided mm -hmm. to incarcerated because you know the revenue is what it is and so whether you have a thousand people in a juvenile detention facility or a hundred the way that I have shown you things is the amount of revenue that the city or the county gets is the same and mm -hmm. so, you know it, the amount of revenue is based on the the amount spent in that locality and the sales tax rate those are fairly stable but the incarceration levels change so essentially we're looking at a scenario where the county or the city may have ten dollars to spend on a meal or two dollars to spend on a meal and so uh studies in in that nature have looked at quality because you know that's one of the challenges i have is determining quality uh and you know quality uh, the way that other studies have found it they have looked at the uh space cell space that inmates have, the amount of outside time that they have, you know, recreation time, the uh, staff per uh, inmate, even exit surveys on social, on services that they were provided, because, you know, inmates take exit service on the quality of food, on, you know, quality of health care, um, and um, as well as the amount of money that is spent on, you know, meals and, and things like that. Um, but so those are kind of the quality in indicator as well as, you know, to some extent, you could also look at um, uh, recidivism rates. Uh, the problem with recidivism is that it's impacted by so many things other than, uh, you know, the rehab itself. But supposedly, you know, the, the less people go back to jail, the more it means that somehow the rehab programs are working. Uh, so nothing is really conclusive, but somehow we would expect this money or the quantity of it on a per capita level to produce an indication of quality, right? Um, so, but you know, uh, the, the, the one issue that I think we'll, we'll run into, and, and you know, this comes from my own ignorance, at least at this point in time of how uh, criminal funding works, is that I would suspect that even for the most local of juvenile detention facility, there is a great amount of state and federal government funding. And so at the end of the day, the portion really that comes from the special purpose local option sales tax might be a bucket in the water, mm -hmm. where it makes a really small difference. Um, so if it, it's not the case where they're 100% funded through the spe special purpose local option sales tax, but probably it's more of a added benefit. So in that respect, I, I would imagine that, you know, it may not really 
give that great of a difference. But I guess we'll see. You know, we'll see what what the data says. Um, and then you brought up the uh, equality. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because um, <laughs> on equality, uh, it, it's funny because especially in the United States, you know, we are very uh, uh, loner people. You know, we like our space, uh, we like our freedom, um, and that is, in my opinion. Um, kind of uh, against uh, how we can achieve equality. Um, because in equality would somehow dictate that there is some central place that bestows things equally to all. But as we all have more freedoms to catch, I mean, the same is true. I mean, we can all just walk away from money and think about hunting right? Let's say we all go on a hunting trip. Well, some of us are better hunters than others. I certainly wouldn't be catching anything because one, I'm not a good hunter and two, I wouldn't kill any animal. But, you know, some of us are really good shooters and they, you know, really don't care. So some of us are going to go home with, you know, lots of meat and some of us are going to go home hungry. And so how do you achieve equality? Well, the way you would achieve equality is you would need to have a referee that takes whatever amount the group has collected and spread it evenly, right? Um, but in America, we're not comfortable with that. We don't like that intervention. Um, and so I think uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle because we say we want equality, but I think at, at large, we are not willing to take the measures that it takes to get that equality. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Amanda, I'm sure there's other questions. Yes, there is. Um, one person asks, what are some of the reasons why Washington decided to earmark the special purpose local option sales tax? to the criminal justice system? And do you think other states will follow that practice as well? Um, I do not think other states will follow. Uh, and to be honest, I do not know why Washington decided. Um, uh, but yeah, that's um, something I'll need to look into. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think the way that we are going to see this happen more and more and more and more um, is with respect to um, transportation, and public education. If you think about on a, on a local level, and those of you that are homeowners maybe can relate to this more, but if you think about on a local level and you look outside the window, what kind of services that you consume indirectly are actually paid through local dollars? And that would be you know, mowing of grass in local areas, uh, that would be county roads, uh, public schools. Uh, those are the kinds of services that are financed through local dollars and that's where the special purpose local option sales tax is about is probably going to find more room as we move away from the property tax. Uh, typically, you know, the criminal justice programs are typically financed through some central government, typically the state um, or maybe the, the county. So this level of devolution of criminal justice program is quite unusual, um, I think. So I would suspect that we're not going to see a future for special purpose local option sales tax for criminal justice programs, but we are probably going to see a big future of um, public education, which I think is really what the alarming uh, feature of this is, um, you know, because um, uh, you know some some remark I made uh, in my book just last week. Um, if you look at the composition of federal spending, we have basically a big chunk that goes on military spending, and another big chunk that goes on other non-discretionary spending like Social Security, Medicare, entitlement programs. That really leaves a tiny, tiny, tiny portion for education, transportation, healthcare, and everything else. And when you look at the indicators, you know, it's, it's no surprise that uh, American students are, you know, mediocre in most fields, that uh, public transportation was ranked at a D plus on a worldwide level by the um, Worldwide Association of Architects, I don't remember, but I have citation for those who need it. Um, so essentially we're failing really at almost everything other than, other than military. <laughs> so um, anyway, I got off topic. How there. long can you run a military with those, uh, those other deficits? Yep, 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 exactly. And so, you know, what, what we have is this pressure you know, I, you know, we have this pressure for teachers to meet state standards, and we have the pressure for students to meet standards, and, but we don't really have the resources that go 
to meet those standards. Uh, you know, for those of us that, that work in academia, I think we, we see that also at the college level. <laughs> you, know, you don't need to look at the, at the, at the kindergarten and, 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 and uh, you know, elementary schools, but even at the college level, we have the same scenario where you're trying to achieve something and it always feels like the resources that go to achieving that are less and less and less, so. All right, we've got another question. Um, this one relating to Minnesota and the Minneapolis St. Paul metro area. In the 1970s, they created an agreement um, which uh, was addressing the population moving from the city core to the suburbs. And that agreement shares property tax revenue to equalize funding for the local schools. Do you know of any other agreements like this and how this would affect people's attitudes towards taxation? Yeah, I don't know of any voluntary agreements um, between uh, local jurisdictions, but as I said, uh, you know, the, the states are not unaware of how a local sales tax works. They, are, they know exactly that it's discriminatory. They know exactly that it shifts revenue away from rural areas. And the way they try to make up for that is through some kind of mitigation system. And the mitigation system is what I showed you, for example, with respect to one local option sales tax in, in Washington, the county gets to keep only 60% and the other 40% is distributed with the, with the cities. Um, some other states have a system where the county only keeps 50% and the other 50% goes to the state and the state then distributes it across across uh, the state according to population. So these are efforts to mitigate the discriminatory effect. Um, in a sense, you know, you can compare it to, uh, you can compare it to a, a car salesman commission. You know, what we're basically telling these counties is that if you raise more revenue for me, I'll let you keep some of it, right? So if you make a sale, you'll keep some of it. Uh, that's really what we're saying. But at the end of the day, the county is still going to keep some revenue. So, um, you know, then I suppose, you know, local governments could enter agreements to shift risk. That kind of opens up a, an interesting side topic because if you think about um, what that really is, um, that's a, you know, that's a, a hedging, that's a hedging mechanism where they're trying to essentially hedge the risk of the fluctuation in revenue. No, no different than what banks do with interest rates. You know, <laughs> banks enter into uh, hedging interest rate agreements where, uh, you know, they try to even the playing field of risks if, with a shift of interest rates across jurisdictions. Uh, so it's really no different, but um, I'm not aware of any, but I'm not surprised either that there are some. Do you think the shift of the U.S. economy from an agricultural and uh, industry-based economy to a consumer economy, and therefore the, pro the proportion of the economy that falls under a sales tax versus a property tax is part of the shift to local sales taxes? Well, it's part of the shift towards sales tax in general. Um, you know, it's, it's rather interesting because the, in the United States, we love spending. Uh, we love leverage. We love spending with money we don't have. Uh, if you know, if, if you think about this is this is actually a rather interesting and, and scary reflection. Um, there is very very little in the Internal Revenue Code that actually promotes saving, if anything at all. The only thing that kind of subtly promote saving is saving for retirement. And that is simply so that there is less stress on the social security system that is already overstressed. But other than that, you don't get any bonus points for putting money in a savings account. What you do get bonus points for is potentially spending it and spending it on deductible things. So there is this pressure of the economy at large and you can see it right now, right? I mean, and it makes sense because the way that our economy works, our economy works by spending. We make a, we pay a lot of attention to consumer confidence. Uh, to money going around. You know, Congress is about to pump $2 trillion into the economy. Um, so for us, the money circulating is the way that our economy works. And we also boast having the largest economy in the world. Um, but, uh, and so what that has done, it has basically boomed the tax base. Remember the base is what we tax. So we're, if, if you have a country where people save and spending is this little, you know, taxing spending is not going to give you a whole lot of revenue. But in the United States, you're looking at basically this enormous tax base, enormous tax base that is provided by spending, which is what makes the sales tax so popular, so successful, on top of the fact that it is invisible 
and is politically acceptable because taxpayers and voters don't see it as much. And so you're more likely, actually research has shown that you're more likely to win an election if you run on a platform based on raising sales tax than if you run on a platform based on raising income tax or property tax. Um, so I, you know, yeah, that's kind of, I think if we didn't have a, if we didn't have a constitutional barrier, we will very likely have a federal sales tax at some point. All right, we've got one final question. Uh, if your ultimate conclusion is that only one county is functioning effectively, mm -hmm. what is the solution as far as tax is concerned? Um, yeah, so there, there's a, there's one thing that we do in law that we don't do in other fields. In law, we like to prescribe solutions. You know, that's that's not common of other fields. In other fields, we just reach the conclusion and let others draw <laughs> draw the solution. But the prescriptive element, of course, is you know, uh, is this meeting the legislative intent? Um, so if the legislative intent is to you know evenly provide financing based on need, then the legislative intent is not met if the flow of money is uneven. So then in terms of prescribing a solution, the solution would typically be just like what one of the uh, viewers suggested, which is could be a voluntary solution by way of mutual agreements or even better by a total 100% state collection system, in other words, eliminating local option sales taxes entirely and just collecting the central level, which I think would never fly in a place like the United States, then at that point, we would go back to, well, in that case, we have to augment the mitigation system. In other words, you cannot let a county keep half of the revenue. You must have a county, you can let the county keep 5%, 10%, 15%, but not more. Any more than that is going to basically create more discrimination. So basically uh, increase the uh, the mitigation requirements, the, the sharing with the higher government requirement. Um, but, uh, but I think the, you know, the prescriptive element more than anything is uh, away from the, the criminal justice programs. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but, it, uh, you know, for me, it's not about the, the criminal uh, justice programs as this tax goes to finance, and it's not about the tax uh, itself, but it's about the, the bigger scheme of things. And that is we cannot earmark revenue that is highly volatile and localized with critical government functions, the need for which is not local. In other words, you cannot tie the money on a local level for a need that is not local, that is critical, and that is stable at a level higher than the locality. So if there is a critical need for public education, and that critical need is not a need only for the city of Seattle, it's not a need only for the city of Minneapolis, it's a need countrywide doesn't matter whether, you know, kids go to school in the most remote part of Alaska, they still need the same level of education, right? So the need is critical and not local. You cannot tie that need with a source of revenue that is highly local. That's the real message, aside from whether you do it for education, transportation, or anything else. That's how I, I think is the prescriptive part of it. Okay. One more question. Yeah. Knock in there. Um, you mentioned that one of the questions you were trying to answer was whether rural counties were able to make up the discriminatory effect of the yeah. special purpose sales tax. Have you begun to answer that question? And if so, what are some of the things those counties are doing? Uh, no, I have not begun that question. I will say that in counties in, uh, in states like Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia, where this has happened for public education, uh, basically what the state has done, the state has simply said, look, I'm going to share some of the revenue by way of the mitigation, but other than that, you're toast. And so you do have indeed kids in rural Tennessee that are getting three times less money than kids in, you know, the cities uh, in, in Tennessee. Um, so um, now in terms of what I would expect, you know, if you think about me as a local government official in any county that is impacted by this, especially in a state like Washington, I cannot tap into the local income tax. Um, the sales tax is not a winning strategy for me for whatever reason, right? Maybe I don't have shopping opportunities or I don't have people with high income where I, where I am or whatever. Um, how else would I raise revenue? So if you look at the revenue raising uh, strategy, that leaves me with the property tax. So maybe I could run on a, you know, a risky property tax platform, um, or more likely, I'm probably going to adopt essentially an enterprise system where I'm going to start operating more and more like enterprises. And if you haven't noticed, we have more cities 
that are starting to run like enterprises in the way that they run utilities, uh, in the way that they charge for services, in the way that they charge for you know uh, permits. You know, suddenly you have uh, permit fees that skyrocket. You know, uh, fees for water hookups and electricity. Uh, you know, for those of you that get your cell phone bill, I, I dare you next time you get your cell phone bill to look for the local utility fee. Um, so the utility fees, the user fees, uh, permit fees, um, those are the biggest source of revenue. But yeah. All right, we do have one more actually ah. just to keep popping in with a quick question. Yeah, no worries. Um, in efforts to educate consumers on what types of invisible taxes are being used and therefore have a better understanding of where their money is going, do states ever require increased disclosure requirements to <laughs> alert consumers of where their taxes are going? And if so, are they effective? <laughs> um, so we, we live in the United States. Um, this is a place where Pepsi and Coca-Cola are allowed to spend $22 million on a campaign to cap sales tax rates where the other side was spending 125,000. And so, uh, you know, some of us like to think of democracy, but the, the way that our democracy works, you can compare it to a dollar representing a vote. So the more dollars you have, the more votes you get to cast. Uh, we see this all the time, you know, in, in, in presidential campaigns and so on. So what I'm trying to say here is that we have a greater interest to actually limit education. Take, for example, the Washington Initiative 1634. Now, I'm, you know, I'm no different than any other. It's not like I like to pay tax. You know, no one does. But if you look at what the local taxes do, the local taxes are trying to basically fill the need, the gap for revenue. We have the need for local services. We have this devolution where the state or the federal government is saying, you shall provide the service with no money or little money attached. So the localities are, especially in a state like Washington, they cannot tap into a local income tax, so they move on to the sales tax. And so it's easy to you know, demonize that and just say with, with, with voters, something that says, you know, you, you're, your mayor wants to raise sales taxes. That, I mean, that, that, that works really well, right? It scares, it scares the voters, no one wants to pay more tax. But in that case, it would have taken a really massive education campaign on why that is necessary and where this money is going to go. And even so, maybe, maybe voters would have been more on board with that. But it takes somebody to pay for this education. And I think there is a far bigger interest against it than it, there is for it. So I would like to say that I'm, I'm not very optimistic <laughs> that we are going to get the money and the resources and the will from you know special interest groups uh, to actually educate the public on what they need to know. So. Scare tactics work really well in politics. Um, you know, so not, not all of us are working for the common good. <laughs> Sorry guys, no, I, <laughs> I, I know I'm starting to sound like, you know, some kind of, I'm gonna go cut my veins now, but <laughs> all right are we done that is all for questions all right first so let me do one last thing i want to thank you uh dr reed and amanda for putting this together uh, i want to thank all those that are uh that attended so i hope i didn't put you to sleep and uh if you uh uh you know want to fall in love with tax like i did uh feel free to reach out my email address uh is somewhere i assume uh, well, if not, Amanda can give that out. All right. Thank you very much. Fabio, thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. You made tax exciting. And that's, <laughs> not, that's not easily done. You made it exciting. You made it socially relevant. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Again, um, welcome back, everybody, to the Journal of Law and Public Policy's Symposium. We will be starting this afternoon with a discussion on social mobility and public good. I will let Dr. Reed introduce our first speaker. Well, uh, Amanda, first I want to say thank you for your efforts. Thank you for, for handling this, we, uh, steering it through a crisis. As I said this morning, I'll repeat it this afternoon for those who are just joining us. Your efforts have been nothing less than heroic. Heroic under enormous stress, under enormous uh, 
novelty. It's just been heroic what you've accomplished. Thank you so much. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Nancy Jurek from Arizona State University. She's, uh, she's a sociologist there. She works in the, and teaches in the Department of, of, uh, of Law and Social Inquiry, did I get, or Justice and Social Inquiry, did I get that right? That's it. And um, uh, she's worked on feminism, she's worked on, on criminology. Uh, she is uh, most recently returned from the Czech Republic where she uh, did a semester long Fulbright and um, she returned in January. And um, I want to say welcome back. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, Professor Jurek, please. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be able to do this. And, and again, thank you, Amanda and Charles both for the work on this. And I know, Amanda, this was uh, tense and, and uh, it looks like you pulled it off, so I'm really pleased. Um, I'm, I'm going to do my share screen at this point. And hopefully that's showing up okay. Does that, everybody see a PowerPoint? I can see it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk about efforts to garner public support for programs that will assist uh, US women business owners. And one of the themes of my research that emerged is that there's a kind of pressure uh, to make gender neutral arguments about why these programs for women should be supported. Uh, but these are important issues in terms of public policy and social mobility uh, and, and inequality. And I'll make that clear, I hope, in the presentation. Um, I'm gonna report on observations uh, that I have of efforts to document uh, the experiences of women business owners. And this study was done in the Phoenix area. It included uh, cities outside of Phoenix, but predominantly focused on, on Phoenix more um, than others, other cities. Um, there was research that was conducted, a large survey, and qualitative interviews. And I'm associated with the qualitative interview component, but I also help some in interpreting the survey results. Um, there's a, often a problem cited for women-owned businesses. They're multiplying very quickly, but uh, the success rates for women-owned businesses in terms of the hiring employees, how much money they make, how much profit, and their growth potential overall tends to be less for women business owners than for men business owners. Um, there are a number of feminist uh, scholars, both in business, sociology, um, and certainly in law, but, but focusing on business, that have critiqued the male-centered models of business that, that entrepreneurs are associated with being uh, competitive, risk, uh, willing to take on lots of risk, interested in big business growth, and so on, and, and uh, very much focused on the business first and everything else uh, in terms of, of life kind of being subordinated to that. Uh, feminist business scholars have called for gender-aware approaches in assisting business owners and understanding some of the differences that plague women as a group versus men as a group. Um, this leads to arguments that there need to be more assistance programs tailored for women business owners. And we have a pretty several decades of history of trying to do that. Um, I'm going to talk about some entrepreneurial support organizations, some of which focused on women and some of which focus generally on entrepreneurs and some of which focused on socially marginal, socially marginalized entrepreneurs, meaning people of color, poor people, uh, disabled, et cetera, people that have challenges in entrepreneurship but want to start businesses nevertheless. And um, there are government and NGOs, when I talk about ESOs, I'm talking about those that offer training mentoring, networking for business owners. Uh, my focus in the research I'm reporting on today is that on the efforts of an umbrella organization, which I'm calling GROW, and that was comprised of a, a 
group of ESO service providers in the Phoenix area, and, and as I said, a few coming in from other cities. Uh, and the effort was to document the contributions and the needs of women business owners in the greater Phoenix area, sometimes outside of Phoenix. GROW coordinated a large survey and an in-depth, they funded my in-depth interview study of women business owners to produce the first large scale research study of women business owners in Arizona cities, again, focusing mostly on Phoenix. Um, the data that I'm gonna to refer to in this presentation uh, are that the qualitative portion of the research, I interviewed 43 women business owners of varying races and we purposely varied. So it's not a random sample. Uh, it is a purposive sample that tried to vary race, the age of the business, the family status of the owner, did she have children or not, uh, and what type of business did she have. And those are things that we tried to vary. The interviews allowed the space for the respondents to talk about their business objectives, the opportunities they felt they had, their perceived barriers, things like childcare issues, work-life balance, discrimination, those were, there was space in that if they wanted to talk about those things in the interviews. The survey sample was quite a different sample. It had older, larger businesses and a smaller percentage of women of color who were really very much underrepresented uh, in, this, in that study. Um, they reported more, the respondents there reported more success in getting business loans outside funding uh, more, they had more employees, they had greater growth aspirations, and more reports of profitability than the interview study. And part of that is because the way this survey was collected was that it was given to different women business owner organizations around the Valley and a uh, Phoenix area. And they, those organizations disseminated it on their website. And it meant that, that the organizations that were tapped tended to be the more successful, more advanced, uh, longer term women's businesses. Um, after those, that research, I also did participant observation of Google Doc development of the final report from these two pieces of research. And I was part of in-person meetings, all to prepare a final report that would be disseminated uh, on the website of GROW. Um, af around that time, I also conducted interviews with 12 service providers who worked in ESOs, most of whom were involved in developing the report. Um, the findings that I wanna talk about um, are just that most of the GROW leaders and the ones particularly I inter interacted with identified as feminists and they wanted to encourage gender aware women business owner programming. They were familiar with the arguments of scholars about gender aware programming. Yet in developing the report, their aim was to convince non-feminist, it doesn't mean anti-feminist, but non-feminist funding agencies, they wanted to get those government agencies and NGOs to be willing to put money to supporting services that were sensitive to women. Because that was the objective, they wound up a lot emphasizing the growth potential and economic contributions of women business owners to the local economy. And they started estimating if there was, you know, if there were more resources, how much would all these businesses contribute to the economy? That meant that they were looking a lot at the survey results and that was, those were some findings in there. Uh, the thing that happened is this kind of orientation of wanting to convince the non-believers who thought there were plenty of programs and programs that were aimed at business in general, women could just brave themselves and go in there and it would be fine. Um, and so this orientation though generated a report that stressed goals and strengths and challenges to women business owners that were highly similar 
to those that characterize men owned businesses. And so they talked about profits, uh, again, number of employees, growth, uh, that, that women, the sample survey sample was more willing to take on risk and apply for external funding and so on, which from the data of other research, that was a little bit, again, skewed to the more successful women business owners. There was a tendency, and we had discussions about this, because in the interview study, work-life balance and childcare issues in running a business if women had small children were definitely big topics of conversation. But the leaders of the, of the GROW report thing wanted to not overemphasize work-life balance or child care issues or women who were trying to develop businesses that would meld well with family and income earning. And they really wanted to get away from that so that they sort of did not just stereotype all women-owned businesses as a lifestyle or oriented around child care. And so this was a constant kind of tension. Um, that I would bring up and say, but we have to put some things in. And when, when my findings were getting summarized initially, um, a lot of that was left out. And so uh, eventually some went in there, but overall there was a kind of gender, gender neutral framing that I think undermined arguments that women need unique support services. Uh, but this is a, a precarious balance to try to talk about and um, this brings me to the theoretical issues. My findings made me go back to some of the debates that were very strongly argued in feminist jurisprudence writings uh, in the 1980s and 90s about the sameness and difference of women and men and the arguments about, well, are women at the core essentially the same or are they essentially different? And there was, a struggle, I think, over sameness and difference in the efforts to write the report. And it is a difficult issue um, about doing that, get, given that part of their audience was people who didn't believe that women-owned businesses were important and they thought all women-owned businesses were lifestyle kinds of businesses. Um, and so there was a, a sense of a need to defy those stereotypes. Um, Critiques of business literature are challenging arguments that say either that women are all the same or that women business owners are different from men business owners. That the research basically shows that the differences that are observed between men as a group and women business owners as a group are really more related to the characteristics of their business, like their business age um, and their type of business. Bit, women tend to go into businesses that are very competitive and labor intensive, uh, but when they don't, they compare much more similarly to men who are like, say, in tech businesses. Also, business owners' social location, by here I mean their social class position, um, their, again, family status, if they have children, if they have support from families, if they have education, business skills, so on that those things are as important in producing differences in business, um, business outcomes as the owner gender. And, but there's still a lot of focus, even in the, the feminist business literature, on the growth potential for women business owners. And there are increasingly, I'm seeing entire conferences and special issues of journals talking about the growth problem and how to help women business owners out of the growth problem. Um, the problem with that is that it ignores the fact that some people, both men and women business owners, actually don't want super high growth businesses. They want more controlled growth. Um, and so theoretically, I argue going back to, to some of the black feminist uh, writings of Patricia Hill Collins and others, but that what we need is a both and perspective. We need both and arguments. And we need to have intersectional perspectives that look at the variations within gender group 
by class, race, age, but also if we're talking business, the type of business that they're trying to get into and other differences that produce different business outcomes. But I'm gonna argue even beyond this though, that as long as profitability and growth and competitiveness remain the major criteria for evaluating business success, that as a group, women business owners will remain a low priority for support uh, when compared with men-owned businesses. Um, we also need, I think, to weigh our criteria for supporting women business owners. And I was asked this in, in Prague when I was there at a meeting of, of uh, ESO practitioners, uh, what are the criteria? Do we want to just help growth businesses or do we want to help uh, everybody that wants to have a more uh, a business that helps them develop work-life balance do we want should that be an objective of government to support and that's the hot debate but uh, feminist business scholar Helen all calls for an examination of gender equality goals in supporting business ownership and we might extend that to looking at people's desire to start business uh, from all sorts of different populations that are going to have struggles, people that are poor that still would like to try to run a business. Do we want to be able to support that in our society? Is that worth a public policy of support? People that are disabled, it's struggling. If you don't have resources, it's a real struggle to start business. Um, the problem remains that organizations like GROW still have to gain funding to help women business owners. And so they, they're faced with that. And it was easy for me to say, but look, these other problems are here, but, but their framing was gonna go to policymakers with, with funding resources. How can, can these groups appeal to government and NGOs, and especially groups that only care about economic growth, and how can they do that and not fall into the gender neutral trap that I've outlined here, because if, if basically the, the problems are all the same, why would you need anything different for these other groups? But if you argue that they need, they have different needs and they're different problems and they're different struggles, then you need different programs. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, can people hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, Amanda, should I pose a couple questions now? Or after, uh, maybe I should, just a couple questions. We have actually just one clarification question, and we are going to move on to the next Oh, we're going to move on. Okay. Yep, but um, just one clarification question. Um, can you provide a definition for non-feminist agencies and what do these agencies typically look like? When I said non-feminist, uh, they're, they're chambers of commerce and there's a Arizona Economic Development Council and people working on economic development out of the governor's office. And so when I said non-feminist, again, I, I did not mean anti-feminist, but these are organizations that set up uh, funding for business development and uh, some of the grow uh, leaders had talked to them and they basically said, we don't see any reason to have any special programming for women. There are plenty of business programs and they can just get in it. And so the GROW people define them as people that had more of a gender neutral uh, agenda. They really didn't see any need to focus on gender issues in business. Are we, are we going to move to the next speaker then? We are, and then the last half hour or so will be question and answer for everybody. I'd like then to introduce Professor Hannah Haxgaard, who is at the University of South Dakota School of Law, and uh, she has done work. I've, re I've reviewed your work. You've done great work on access to justice in, in, in rural communities, and um, and you will be sharing some of, uh, oh, you've disappeared from my screen. Oh, there you are, Hannah. Uh, can you hear me? 
I can, yes. And I can hear you, Fa uh, fabulous. You've done some great work. And I look forward to what you're going to say today under these, uh, these difficult circumstances. Thank you so much for being here. I help say hello to your young child. Um, yes. And we'll start, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eden. Again, I want to thank Amanda because she has just done amazing work getting us all together to make this happen today. Um, so yes, I'm Hannah Haxgard. I am an associate professor at the University of South Dakota School of Law. As you can see on this PowerPoint, I'm going to be talking about court appointed attorneys today, specifically talking about hourly rates and access to justice in rural areas. And I think this fits under the broad umbrella of the symposium and talking about inequalities in two ways. So first we fit under an unequal inequalities of class in the sense that when we're talking court appointed attorneys, we are talking about clients who are classified as indigent. And we're also talking about inequalities of geography where there might be some differences between rural and urban areas. Now, um, let me just start by saying what prompted this research. Like, why did I want to go and look at hourly rates and the impact on legal services? It's all prompted by anecdotes. I do a lot of research on rural lawyers and the rural lawyer shortage. And especially over the last year, a repeated theme has come up, which is rural lawyers saying, I don't take court appointments because those rates do not cover my overhead expenses. So rural lawyers are opting out of court appointed work, which of course raises some concerns that I'm going to talk about here. So my goal is really to sort of figure out, do these anecdotes translate into a bigger problem? And then of course, the discussion always, well, are there policy fixes that we can consider? So I wanna make a couple of introductory points to kind of get us on, all on the same page about how these um, court appointments and hourly wages work. So first off, the type of services covered. We all tend to think about criminal appointments first. We have public defender's offices in a lot of places, but um, public defenders will have conflicts. So we frequently will use court appointed attorneys in criminal cases if the PD has a conflict. It's also true that while well, the entire state of Maine does not have a public defender's office. And then um, a lot of rural counties don't have public defender offices because they don't have a population big enough to support a standalone office. So all of the defense work in a lot of small counties is done by court appointed attorneys. So we have a constitutional mandate to appoint attorneys in criminal work. We also have statutory guidelines that vary between states as to when we want to um, appoint attorneys in other situations. So some state statutes will require appointed attorneys, um, for example, guardian ad litems for kids, maybe for parents who are facing termination of parental rights. Um, some states will require appointed attorneys for civil commitment cases, and kind of the list goes on, but it becomes state specific and what the state wants to do in their particular code. So we kind of see them in both the civil and the criminal context. Um, I also want to start with sort of, well, how do we calculate compensation? There's three different systems that are used, and it's worth keeping in mind that all states are different here, but there's three systems that we tend to use. So system one is we have a specific rate that's set in the code or in other regulation. So a specific hourly rate is written down somewhere. The second system is the hourly rate is determined at the discretion of the court for any particular case. And the third system is we can determine rates through contract. So that tends to look like is um, a court may contract with a law lawyer or a law firm to handle all type of X cases for X dollar amount that they determined through contracts. So I just wanna give you two examples of hourly rates. Um, of course, it's again, it's a 50 state system. It's hard to draw um, sort of uniform things from, from anywhere, but I just wanna give you two examples. So South Carolina compensates appointed attorneys at a rate of $60 an hour 
for in-court work and $40 an hour for out-of-court work. Now, the reason I'm talking dollar amounts and I point this out is because the problem for many folks is that these rates don't cover overhead. No one, is, no one has been able to do a good calculation of average overhead costs, although people keep trying, but it's pretty universal that we think an average overhead cost per hour is at least $40, which means here, if you're working for $40 an hour, you're not actually making a profit because all you're doing is covering your overhead costs. Some people estimate the overhead costs for your average attorney to be much higher. Now look at the Massachusetts example. You can see that they break their stuff out a little bit more. So they started $100 an hour for homicide cases. Sounds pretty good, but then it drops off pretty steeply. So only 68 an hour for other criminal cases occurring in its superior store court, only 55 an hour for children and family law cases, and then we drop all the way down to 53 an hour for sex offender registry cases, mental health cases, cases about children in need of services, and cases that occur in its district courts. So just two examples, and again, every state's going to have different system. But one thing that shows up in a lot of state codes or state systems is that there are other limitations on payment. So I might have a maximum total compensation that says something like, you're only allowed to bill no more than $1,500 for this entire case. I might have a maximum number of billable hours. So the code might say, you can only bill seven hours for a misdemeanor or something like that. And then we might have severe limitations on reimbursement for expenses. So that would include travel, but it also might include experts or investigators or any other court expenses that you might have. So we do have these other limitations that come into play that I'll circle back to and talk about why those matter. So that's sort of the background of what these um, hourly rates for court appointment lawyers look like. Now, why is this a problem? Why are we talking about it? Well, the government has a constitutional and statutory obligation to provide lawyers in certain circumstances. And the reality is that the government cannot fulfill that obligation when the rates are too low. So as we go through here, I'm going to talk about whether we have enough lawyers but we don't, have an, we don't just have to have enough lawyers, we have to have lawyers who are accessible and we have to have lawyers who are competent. So I'll frame those kind of in the negative of I'll talk about insufficient lawyers, inaccessible lawyers, and ineffective lawyers. Now, as I said, I tend to do research in rural areas and a lot of this I'll frame through particular problems with access to justice in rural areas. But I think everything I'm talking about today also applies to other levels of population. These are relevant in urban areas, in suburban, and ex-urban, in rural areas. My argument is simply that for a variety of reasons, these problems might be exacerbated in rural areas, but I don't think they're unique to rural areas. The other thing to keep in mind is to the extent that we can come up with solutions that help in rural areas, they should also help everywhere else because the same problem exists. So let's get into the details a little more. So I say here that we probably have insufficient number of lawyers if our hourly rates dip too low. So why is that? It's because the wages don't cover the overhead. It's not because it's greedy lawyers saying I have to earn more. It's because they actually lose money taking these cases. Lawyers also say it's a problem because I have to charge private clients more in order to make up the difference because the government rates are so low. Now this can be extra bad in a rural area where my number of lawyers is already really low. Imagine a county where I only have one or two lawyers in the entire county. One of those lawyers opts out and I have a situation where there just are not enough lawyers to take these cases. Now remember too, 
that rural counties are extra reliant on court appointed lawyers because they don't have public defenders offices. So it's not like in criminal context, these are just extra attorneys that we might use occasionally. We're talking about situation in rural counties where they don't have public defenders. So the entire criminal justice system runs through appointed lawyers because that's all who's available. So this of course is related to inaccessible lawyers. And here I'm talking about location. This is the area that I think is the biggest sort of difference when we're talking about rural areas of, this is a big problem in rural areas because if my local attorneys won't take cases, if I only have a couple of local attorneys and they say, I can't afford, or I don't wanna take these cases, the government's of course under an obligation to keep looking for attorneys. That means they're going to turn to other counties. They might turn to other states. Now add in the fact that in rural areas, I have a lot more conflicts of interest because I have very few attorneys working in sort of a geographic area. And it puts into the situation that government entities might be looking further and further outside of their communities to find lawyers. I won't get into it too much here, but suffice it to say that scholars have established that having to travel long distances to access lawyers is a problem and creates an access to justice issue. So we should just care about travel time between clients and their lawyers. And then the final piece here is, are the rates so low that we're creating ineffective lawyers? Now, the appointed lawyers, I think, and I think everyone agrees that they're important, that they're doing good work, that it's absolutely necessary to our criminal and civil justice systems. Despite appreciating the lawyers, we have reason to be concerned about their effectiveness. So one point is that young lawyers are the ones who are willing to lose money in order to get experience. So young lawyers, will cut their teeth on these cases, get cut courtroom experience, understanding that they're just not making any money, but they're okay with it because they're getting experience. Once they get that experience, they stop taking the cases, which means my experienced lawyers are opting out. So that's especially a problem if we're talking about young lawyers who are hanging up their own shingle, being solo practitioners because they may not have good mentors who are helping them get through and sort of provide great representation to their clients. The other thing is that those caps I talked about of total dollars or my cap on my total number of hours, those incentivize lawyers to spend less time on each case. And that's a problem because if the money cuts off after a certain dollar amount or a certain number of hours, an attorney might just stop there, even though the client should have more work done. So solutions then. Well, it's easy to say, let's just increase the hourly rate, bump it up to 100 or $150, right? That sounds great. So obviously there's some political process problems with that. We're all very clear on that. Um, but I also think that even if we just increase those rates, it's not necessarily a silver bullet for solving these access to justice issues. So if we're going to increase hourly rates, we also need to, like take away caps on maximum dollar amounts or substantially increase them, or we need to take away the caps on maximum number of hours, or we need to increase those caps. So that's something we also have to package with it. And sort of circling back to the rural aspect, there's not enough lawyers in rural areas. Scholars have established that at this point, and having higher hourly wages does not just make lawyers appear to take cases where I don't have lawyers to begin with. So this is one of those things of, it's not a silver bullet. This isn't going to solve access to justice issues everywhere, but it seems like increasing these hourly rates is an important piece of ensuring that I have lawyers everywhere, right? If I could attract lawyers to rural areas by saying, when you take these court appointed cases, 
you'll be earning a decent hourly wage that will help attract lawyers. Once I have more lawyers, I have more options for my court appointments, which is only a good thing because then I sort of have a more robust system of um, lawyering and justice in these communities. So let me just kind of conclude and bring it back then is that as we think about this, remember it's an inequality of class issue because I'm talking about clients who have been deemed indigent by a court. It's also an inequality of geography issue is that it seems like there's particularly entrenched problems in rural areas where it's actually just more of a problem to have these under market hourly rates. So I will stop there um, and look forward to your questions after we hear from our last presenter. Uh, thank you. Oh, I am muted. Um, oh, nope, you're good. I'm good. Okay. Professor Haxgard, thank you so much for presenting. Uh, wonderful presentation. I do have some questions for you. I'll reserve those until the end. I'd like to introduce Sean Cahill. Uh, who is uh, assistant county uh sean where have you gone in my there you are on my screen um who is assistant county attorney at hennepin county and uh, a friend of Saint, the university of st thomas and, and an alum right 2011. that's Thank what you. i thought you have yep. did you have me in class uh unfortunately no i managed to I, dodge all of your classes but i uh, thought you I missed like my respect I thought you missed, I was on sabbatical one of those years too. So welcome, welcome, uh, Sean. And, Thank and you. I look, uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, appreciate it. Of course, thanks for to St. Thomas for allowing me to present. Let me just see if I can't pull up my screen here for the PowerPoint that I did rebuild. So we should be good to go. Today, I just want to address, first of all, kind of how maybe privilege becomes uh, an issue or impacts sentencing under the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines and Minnesota case law. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, say thanks to the Minnesota Guidelines Commission. They have a tremendous staff that help us with this kind of thing. They actually allow you to email in data practices requests and data requests, and they get back to you in a couple of weeks with your answers. So we've relied on them. Uh, to help with some of the research here and some of the facts we're going to talk about, but uh, this would not be possible without their help and all their willingness to participate. For any of you who are doing research or scholarship, this is a great resource. Use them. Um, but I want to start out by just saying, you know, the reason why this kind of question came up and the issue I want to work with is, you know, most of the folks who I work, prosecutors, judges, are very much operating in good faith. And when they think about sentencing and they think about justice, they are very concerned uh, about treating people equally, following the law. So when you start to bring up questions about how does privilege enter into this and how do these uh, systemic or systematic issues pop up, one of the big concerns that we want to look at are where is privilege coming in and is there a part of the law where it actually permits this kind of consideration to occur? And so diving right into it, I'm going to draw everyone's attention, first of all, to one of the comments right out of the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines. Um, and it's this is, while social economic factors cannot justify departure, such facts may be relevant to determine whether a defendant is particularly amenable to probation. We're going to put this uh, quotation in some context here in a little bit, but really this is the key that I want to talk about today is this acknowledgement. It's kind of an open secret that social and economic factors can play a role in determining whether a person is particularly amenable to probation. And as you're going to kind of hear and go forward is my problem with this is that this provides a backdoor for privilege um, for entering into sentencing decisions, the fact that it's kind of a get out of jail free card for folks who have economic privilege uh, or other privileges that we acknowledge um, stem back, whether it's racial, uh, class, or gender. All of these issues kind of come to bear, and I want to walk through how this happens under the law and then move forward to maybe some possible fixes. So, first of all, just to review. Um, looking at what we were discussing are mitigated or were our downward departures in this case. Now there are two kinds under Minnesota law. The first are durational departures. These are just um, departures which are essentially a reduction of the time served or the time stayed over your head. Uh, for those of you familiar with the sentencing guidelines, um, essentially you have your presumptive guideline. If the court goes below the amount of time executed or served, that's a strict durational time. The second kind, are dispositional departures. 
the guidelines sometimes presume that someone will go to prison for a various offense based on obviously the severity of the offense and their criminal history. And the guidelines say, yep, the presumption is that you will or will not go to prison. When the court departs from that presumption, it is a dispositional departure. In other words, you go from a prison, pres uh, going to prison for your sentence, and instead you are sentenced to probation. As you can imagine, that's actually a very big deal. That is, you are taking a defendant, uh, you're taking the threat of that uh, prison sentence and staying it. You're saying, nope, we're going to let you stay in the community, you're going to receive treatment in the community, or whatever the court orders, so that probation works with you, and you're allowed to stay out of prison. Now, you may have to do local time in, let's say, a workhouse sentence, but again, that's going to be limited, uh, limited to 365 days. So already you're talking possibly spending from years and years in prison all the way back down to staying on probation for a number of years, three, five, ten. Um, and then on top of that, possibly doing some workhouse time, but only up to a year. So it actually is a pretty serious departure when it occurs. Uh, just as when we're looking at factors and what can support these, we're going to go to the uh, guidelines here in just a moment. But it's important to remember that um, a durational or dispositional departure can be supported no matter what by offense related characteristics. That means the courts can look to what occurred in the crime itself that would allow us to depart. In other words, if there's something about the crime, maybe uh, the, the defendant was a passive role or a minor role. It was an aiding and abetting kind of situation where he is the lesser actor. Or maybe it's a certain case where there was an imperfect self-defense uh, claim and the defendant, she just didn't have quite enough to make it a formal defense, but there was enough to say that clearly her conduct was not as bad as someone who either premeditated or planned an assault. Those are the kind of facts that can support either kind of departure. However, for a dispositional departure, um, all, we can only look at, and also look at uh, offender related characteristics. And this is important, is that when the court considers a dispositional um, kind of analysis, the court can also look to the offender themselves. And that's the kind of case law that we're starting to look at and whether or not uh, that plays a role here. So looking at the guidelines themselves, they do recognize a number of mitigating factors. This is not the exclusive list, but they're ones which the court has explicitly recognized. Um, some kind of common sense ones, the victim was an aggressor, uh, the victim played a minor or passive role, uh, the defendant lacked judgment due to physical or mental impairment. It's important to note that this is not talking about impairment with regard to drugs or alcohol. It has to be something like a, a organic mental health concern. Uh, the prior convictions were sentenced contemporaneously. Uh, if you look at it more closely, there's some specific language about how that occurs. Uh, whether there was a substantial excuse or mitigating facts that don't amend, amount to a formal defense. Again, this could be a self-defense claim. Let's say uh, it could not be a formal self-defense because you have the duty to run away, but they still perceive that there was a threat, there was a mutual fight. Um, that's the kind of thing that could possibly lead to that imperfect uh, self-defense claim and that would fit under here. Uh, alternative placement due to serious and uh, persistent mental illness. This is a pretty uh, specific departure factor. This is really relating to folks who could be civilly committed or have long-standing chronic mental health issues which uh, involve them in not only probably the criminal justice system but civil commitment systems. So that's a pretty rare finding. Uh, and also finally on drug convictions, whether uh, treatment placement for you as chemically dependent as possible. Those are kind of the other mitigating factors. But the big one that I'm focusing on here today is this one, and this is section seven. Um, the offender is particularly amenable to probation. This factor may, but need not, be supported by the fact that the offender is um, particularly amenable to a relevant pr uh, program of individualized treatment in a probationary setting. So the key is they suggest that the, the whole point to this is there has to be some sort of individual treatment plan that shows that you are more suitable in the community and uh, rather than sending you to prison. This is important because this of course acknowledges the rehabilitation value and the principle that we want to, uh, the courts to embody when they are passing sentence. We want to re uh, rehabilitate people. We want to bring them into law abiding behavior. And is there something other than incarceration that can do that? So this is an important question. And the issue I have though is when we're looking at this language specifically, it's rather vague. 
And so what we're going to step forward to is the first thing we need to look at is how expansive is this? How much is this departure reason really being used? Uh, first of all, I just took as a three-year scope, 2016 to 2018, 6,136 defendants actually received downward dispositional departures. It means that they had a presumptive prison sentence and they were reduced to some sort of probation sentence. Of those, 4,150 uh, 4, cases cited amenability to probation as a reason supporting departure. That's actually 60%, 66% of all cases. That is a huge number. Um, when you look at all the factors to say that two thirds of these are citing this specific statute shows that this is a common practice of the courts, that it is a huge tool that these courts rely on. So that should give us pause to say, how is that being applied? And the question that I wanna bring that up to is, well, how do you determine amenability? That's really kind of the vague question. I think any practitioners are gonna realize this could be a pretty huge term uh, that allows people to make lots of arguments. Uh, but really the first issue I wanna bring up is that privilege in and of itself supports um, an amenability to probation. And the reason and how it does that is that there's a practical consideration. If you have access to money, support systems, um, even uh, some sort of educational background, more than likely you're gonna have some greater tools to be successful in programming, finding your these programs, um, communicating with service providers, uh, getting yourself even to locations to have interviews, to work with a therapist. If you have a car, you have a lot more flexibility and freedom in life than you do if you're taking the bus everywhere. If you have the ability to pay for parking, rather than uh, trying to scrounge, scrounge together bus fare, it's gonna be a lot easier and you're not worried about where you are going. There's also the time factor. There's a lot of you know, work that we wanna do looking at how does this actually work for someone to get to and from the programs they're expected to participate in. There's also privilege with regard to education. If someone is able to uh, read and write well, to read at a higher level, they're gonna be able to respond uh, and essentially assess written information, some sort of written guidelines, um, rather than someone who simply is not, uh, who does not work well with written materials, who does not respond well to written curriculums. And so that can even determine someone's success program while they are in the treatment program. And so you can just imagine all these practical ways that having a privilege will more than likely make you more amenable to probation just because you can operate in large systems, you can operate in programming, you can operate in a lot of different ways, probably more successfully than folks who do not have that same privilege. And that's where this issue I come in with this comment saying, social and economic factors do play a role and the commission actually acknowledges this. This is the danger that they put themselves. They put this in their own comments. So they recognize that this, and they, more importantly, the reason why they do this is because the Minnesota Supreme Court does it. And that's my second issue, is that the Minnesota Supreme Court has made this problem worse. And particularly it comes back to this initial case, which uh, State v. Trog, uh, provide the citation here. The concern I have with this is that State v. Trog was this case where a young man uh, committed a first degree burglary, was presumed to go to prison. Uh, within that, they brought forward a, a, at sentencing a bunch of folks who came, testified on his behalf, including a, a St. Paul police officer who said this was totally errant, this was totally out of whack, this is not this kind of kid, this was really a mistake. They noted that he was extremely contrite in sentencing. And so they brought up all these factors and then when uh, what had happened is the district court granted uh, the downward dispositional departure, put him on probation, uh, the state appealed. Uh, the court actually, as it worked its way up, the Minnesota Supreme Court actually affirmed uh, the departure. And it, in its holding noted, numerous factors, including the defendant's age, prior record, remorse, his cooperation, his attitude while in court, and the support of friends or family, they're all relevant uh, to a determination whether they are particularly suitable to individual treatment in a probationary setting. And I, kinda, I wanna focus on a couple of these things in the, the language they use. Uh, one is remorse, two, cooperation, uh, his attitude while in court and support of friends or family. The concern I have here is that they do introduce a couple of things which are a little risky for a court to engage in. First of all, moral judgment and cultural judgment. Uh, things like cooperation, things like their attitude in court. This should give us all a moment's pause. 
to say that, you know, especially in our recognition with more uh, conversations we had in the social justice system is, is that right that we should be looking at these kind of factors as a reason to whether you merit the reward of not going to prison? Particularly as let's look in the matter of if we have people who are legitimately questioning what's happening in the social justice system and the fairness of sentencing and uh, disparate treatment among certain communities, you know, for them to say that I do not believe that the social that the criminal justice system is fair, I do not believe that the actions you're taking are appropriate, and I don't believe that um, it's respecting the integrity of my community. If they bring those criticisms to the courtroom under trog, they could be hurt as opposed to someone who does not have, they say, you know what, judge, I absolutely think that this system works. I accept the legitimacy of the courts. I accept what's happening. And I want uh, to throw myself on the mercy of the court. Well, that's a different stance. And there's already some assumptions being made about the person who are saying the are accepting the legitimacy of the courts, who is accepting um, some of the issues behind it. You are saying, we reward people for not questioning what's happening to them. I think fundamentally that's a little bit of a problem. Um, you don't have to buy, and the, frankly, the court, the, sh, the court really should not be concerned with about whether or not the person believe what's happening is right to them. That's not always the role. We want to rehabilitate. We want to engender some sort of insight, but there's also a little bit of we have public safety concerns here, and we, in the question of fairness, we absolutely want to make sure that we want to treat everyone equally. And when that happens the conversation is going to turn not so much on simply as how are you behaving, but what is the nature of your conduct? And I think that's really where the focus should start to turn. I think there are a lot of dangers when we look at things like attitude in court. Certainly if someone who is cussing and throwing a fit and yells at the judge every time they show up into the courtroom, that's going to speak for itself in a variety of different ways. But to suggest that that person should not be entitled to the same possibilities of, um, treatment or therapy uh, is problematic. In addition, I think there's a huge problem with uh, looking at how we can move forward and saying is, what is the person who looks good uh, doing? What is better about them? Just because they may show up in a suit, just they may get, say, call the judge your honor. You know, these are all cultural things, which uh, in a lot of ways are not necessarily the appropriate measure to whether it could be successful. I think in my opinion is there is no indication that those people are going to be successful. Um, and in doing so, I think that's unfair to look at. And I think it rewards folks who have access or even a cultural uh, competency to, you know, speak in, you know, for lack of a better term, maybe proper or, or English uh, more appropriately. It's going to punish people who, um, you know, use slang. It's going to use people who are a little more informal in their presentation. Uh, I think it kind of is an unevil, uh, it invites some sort of uneven consideration. And in doing that, we should step back and say whether or not this is what we should be looking at when we're at sentencing. I also note that it really is not a good way to measure what this person is going to do in a treatment setting. Now, if someone expresses a desire to say, judge, I want to go to chemical uh, dependency treatment, my criminal actions have been uh, really, you know, driven by my alcohol use. I really want to address that. I think I can do that. And there's some, maybe some evidence to support that. Um, probation finds it. There's psychiatrists that do that. Yes, absolutely. There might be uh, some reason for the court to say, great, there's a particular finding supporting their amenability there. But it's not based on how they look and what they say. It's their genuine uh, description and saying what they need to uh, achieve and what they need to have in order to become law abiding. That's, I think, a different measurement than making a moral or cultural judgment. So some places to look at, the, the Sentencing Guidelines Commission does recognize that this is a bit of a problem as well. Um, in their own comments, they also note that, you know, there are factors which the court cannot consider and that these factors may play a role in the amenability to, pro, uh, to probation issue. And that includes race, sex, employment, social factors, marital status, educational attainment. So the commission recognizes the difficult spot that judges are put in by the Supreme Court. They say, here are the list of things you absolutely cannot consider, but they may impact your determination of amenability to probation. You should really avoid trying not to do that, district court judges. Well, I mean, I want to say that that is the good faith and the right thing to say. The issue is how does that work practically? There's no one to really police this with the district courts. Um, I'd want to point out, this is a really a thriving issue. If you look at this case, State versus Soto, 
um, look at not only the opinion, but the dissent by Justice Page. Uh, in that case, it was a first degree criminal sexual conduct case, a rape case that was pretty violent. Uh, the court actually granted a probationary sentence. Uh, it was appealed, the uh, Court of Appeals reversed it, um, finding that uh, no, that was, uh, it was an unfair use of the drug factors and uh, reinstated the execution of sentence. It was appealed to the uh, Supreme Court. Supreme Court uh, did affirm the Court of Appeals, so they supported the execution of sentence. But you should take a look at the dissent. Uh, it has Page, it has uh, Justice Gilday, and I believe Justice Anderson uh, in this conversation saying that no, the court absolutely has the power to use these factors in whatever way it wishes. And so uh, it's a really interesting conversation that shows that these factors are very much a recognized authority for the courts to do what they need but it's a problem. Um, so the kind of the cut to the chase, the places where I see we could move forward with it and some changes, first of all, is self-reform. Um, I think the court, Supreme Court should explore reversing TROG, uh, limiting that these factors can be addressed in a different way that these specific factors as listed really don't give us insight into success and treatment. We have a whole variety of different opportunities that can do that. We, uh, for the defense, I know the public defender system has dispositional advisors that work on this. Probation has a number of pre-sentence uh, investigation tools that can consider this. Uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, there's a lot of folks that are out there and part of the system which can give us better insight as opposed to whether or not uh, your cooperation, your attitude, um, and whether or not you can talk the right way uh, is going to show that you're gonna be successful. In addition, uh, kind of the, the next action down would be correction by the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines or the Minnesota Legislature. The way that the Guidelines Commission works is they're, they propose changes to the guidelines. Um, the issue being t is that they send their uh, recommendations to the legislature. If they don't change them, they actually are become statute. Um, but the Minnesota legislature in itself has the right to take its own action. Uh, the issue being the, uh, what's gonna see with this is whether or not that the legislature can do this, it kind of steps into the purview of the courts, right? Because if they say you can't consider this, uh, there's an issue about whether or not uh, the legislature is stepping in and affecting the discretion the courts have in sentencing which is pretty big. So there's, there are some problems with using this action on its own. Um, finally, the third way that it could be addressed is simply the court should issue, whenever they make uh, sentences with regard to amenability to probation, they should issue written findings which show that they are not using the trog factors. Um, the, the courts have the ability to say, this is what I heard, this is what's important, and this is what I think is, it supports my determination. And they can avoid these trog factors which are really wishy-washy. They can look to reports, they can look to the record, they look to probation recommendations. So overall, I think between those three, we have some options, but I do think generally the fact these exist do merit some concern for prosecutors and judges to make sure that we are using them appropriately. So that's about all I have and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Sean, thank you so much. We give you our virtual applause. And uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, I'd like to pose a question to each of our participants and to get the uh, discussion going. And I'll begin in the order that uh, we've, uh, we've uh, heard the uh, speakers. I'll begin with Professor Jurek. And um, I, a couple of observations and then um, a, um, a question. The observations are, I, I, I think it was a, a fabulous paper. I, I think the idea is simply neutrality, the concept of neutrality, the legal jurisprudential concept of neutrality is really something that at a theoretical level, we always have to do battle with. There is no such thing as neutrality. Uh, in fact, um, everything has, is tilted in the direction of one value, one set of values or another. So we need to acknowledge that. I think secondly, there is a necessity, isn't there, to sell uh, these findings to an, uh, basically, I won't say hostile audience, but at least an unsympathetic audience. And uh, so that's a balancing. How, how far do we tilt in one direction or another? But I'm gonna pose a question to you. Those are my general observations about your paper. My, but my question is this, um, you talk about, uh, Privileging, it, privileging, if you will, or, 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 or 
uh, or, or uh, given much greater weight to companies that show profitability and growth. Let me propose a pair of different values that might uh, serve as counterweights, and, and uh, I'll await your answer, and that is, how about substituting sustainability and st uh, stability? Uh, funders, organizers at the Chamber of Commerce certainly don't want to be funding losing businesses, businesses that are about to go under. On the other hand, sustainability, stability might be a better substitute uh, than profit and growth. That's my question to you, Professor Jurek. My question to uh, Professor Haxgard is, your paper has tremendous uh, resonance. Were you here this morning with uh, Professor Fabio Ambrosio? The, our tax No, uh, unfortunately I wasn't in the panels this morning. Oh, your paper and his have tremendous correlations. Tremendous correlations because he was concerned in his presentation with the use of uh, local funding tax initiatives to support criminal justice. Shame on you, you missed the best presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's a tremendous overlap between the way uh, the, uh, the two of you conceive of, of the problem. And I would like, this is my question to you, I'd like to put you in conversation with Professor Ambrosio, and perhaps we can have a conversation there. Finally, I have a professor, uh, question for, um, not Professor Cahill, but uh, Sean. I have a question for Sean. Um, well, two, uh, first an observation and, and then a question. Um, uh, the, um, qu the observation is simply this. We want, I think, as a society to see those amenable pro to probation to be on probation. We don't want to close the door to people who should be on probation. We have too much incarceration now, far too much incarceration now. We don't want to close the door. What we want is an even-handed application of standards. Not closing the door to, to probation, we, we want an even uh, application of, uh, of standards. And my other uh, con uh, question with, with your paper is, I'd like to push you to think in a larger frame of reference. Right now, it, it's Minnesota. Minnesota is important. We're located in Minnesota. Uh, but um, we, uh, we have a larger frame of reference too. So I'm going to ask you if you, could fo if you could think about how your paper may connect to national issues uh, on incarceration and probation, on class and privilege in uh, the criminal justice system. Those are my questions to the three of you. Professor Jurek, I'm going to ask you if you could kindly go first. I will. Thank you. Thank you for those thoughtful questions. Um, it is definitely an issue of how far do you want to tilt on these different values for business. Um, there is research, uh, and this is going to relate to some of the Q&A. There's a Q&A question that I'm going to try to address at least part of with yours. Um, but there's a lot of research that's been done looking at the investments in um, quote unquote minority owned business, especially some of the funding that goes back way back to the 1970s that was invested in uh, getting, trying to get black capitalism going, so to African American businesses. And some of the arguments are that making a lot of business loans to businesses where the the person is really struggling in terms of learning how to how to run the business, how to set up, and they're setting up a super competitive business, that those loans didn't work out as well as loans that were targeted more to growth-oriented businesses. Um, and so, and this is something that somebody asked of a, as far as a gender-neutral focus, there's evidence that there are certain types of business that if they get funding, they might take off. And, they, and there are people who try to predict this. And so there are people who argue then no loans to businesses that don't meet the growth kind of, and, and I think part of focusing on growth is a kind of gender neutral argument too, that you're focusing on growth businesses. 
Um, and that there's an argument that if you don't focus that way with your public dollars, you don't have measurable economic benefits. Um, and what, what I'm arguing, and it does, it is compatible with your notion about focusing on sustainability and stability, that for a lot of people, small businesses offer them a chance uh, to earn extra money, uh, to earn money perhaps at a time otherwise where they might not be able to. Uh, and so that it would, if you looked at is the business idea something that with support could be sustainable, it would improve the stability of that person or that family's livelihood. Um, huge loans are not really as important for those kinds of businesses as things like te technical assistance, for maybe small loans, but technical assistance, mentoring, offering low-cost business services, uh, and perhaps bridge kinds of assistance in that after a business has been operating for a while, they may want to grow at a certain level. So, so bridge programming that might help do that. All of that costs money, and the tradition has been in U.S. business programming, although there are exceptions, has been to throw a lot of money at businesses, that whatever businesses are identified to, to be helped, uh, businesses of the poor, businesses of, uh, of women, um, or businesses of men and women of color, focusing that way, uh, and the idea is get the loans out there. And the funders want to give money for lending. They don't want to give money for staff or mentoring support or business services. They want the loans out on the street. Uh, I worked with a program for about 12 years. And that was the tendency to want to do that. Um, and it, it doesn't work. Different kinds of businesses have different needs. But a lot of the economic development people that we were dealing with in Phoenix basically want to invest in pro, um, in businesses that are going to help Phoenix become the next Silicon Valley. Uh, and even in the Czech Republic, that's what the government wants to invest in. And so, but there has to be a decision that the investment that providing funds for this is also for other purposes for people to build small and sustainable, I think, businesses. The other thing that one of my graduate students did a research on refugee business programs that they were running in the Bay Area, and the women were joining cooperative businesses, making gardens, doing childcare services. The businesses did not support them enough so that they could quit their factory jobs or whatever jobs they got. But the businesses gave them a little extra money and helped them to really have some enjoyable kinds of work experiences. Their, their pay wage jobs were degrading um, and were hard and they didn't, they were miserable in those, but this gave them an outlet. The problem is, if you go too far with my these arguments that I'm making, you can start saying, well, just give the poor the chance to start a business or give let people start a business and they can everything's going to be solved. In the absence of better safety net programs, that's not an answer. So that's my long answer. And if I could follow up, mm -hmm. uh, what I hear you saying, uh, 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 number one is what we need to invest in is human development human capital, I'm giving you uh, gender neutral uh, terms perhaps, a thriving local economy. We don't want wealth maximization, we want wealth sufficiency. And um, we also recognize that we can't all be a community of business owners. There have to be in this day and age of COVID, there have to be uh, nurses and healthcare workers and people who actually work in, in other settings. So focus on community, focus on, on thriving. Uh, forget the idea of wealth maximization, wealth sufficiency. 
Is this a way of shifting vocabulary? Uh, I would say, you know, of course, you don't want to forget businesses that are going to really grow and contribute to mm -hmm. the economy, you know, in that sense of wealth maximization. Uh, but you have to have programmings for different programs for different purposes and recognize and you have to be sensitive to people's social location. So, so a lot of people that come over that are refugees are used to a little bit more collective society, for example. And so they're more comfortable in collective businesses. But yeah, but you, that you do, you do focus on human development and sensitivity to the social location of whatever kinds of groups you're trying to help and the different problems in that way with with Sean's paper, I think there's some commonalities because of that. If you look at a person's social location, um, you start to see things that will, it, now I'll give one example. One of my students, former students, wrote a beautiful letter to her law school at ASU yesterday about their grading system because they're letting students choose if they want pass fail this semester. And she argues that the students who have a, a home to go to with dedicated great internet, a quiet atmosphere, a quiet room, and a chance to study and aren't getting laid off and having to look for other work, that those people are going to be able to take the regular grade and do great if a student goes home to a family with small children who keep coming in and out of the room. So in other words, you get it. And that depending on the you know, social location of gender, class, race, economics issues, that that's gonna affect what a student can do with a pass fail or not. Thank you. Professor Hacks, Garden, uh, I'll put you in conversation now with Professor Ambrosio. Sounds like I should have been here this morning to listen to Fabio, but I guess I would kind of start this by saying one of the reasons that I'm always pushing that we need to talk about different, um, like we have to talk about rural separate than urban is because there are special issues that come up. So I mean, just and this is in response to one of the Q&A things too, is that there's reasons that internet service or remote work just doesn't cut it in rural areas is that there's a lot of places that don't have good enough internet access to do lawyering through the internet. Um, there's a lot of public libraries in rural areas that don't even have the internet available to their patrons. And so sort of the internet, it doesn't solve the issue of travel and distance. Um, I also think this discussion of using the tax base to support criminal justice um, is a big problem because we might have substantially lower tax base in rural areas. Um, you know, Arizona recently, uh, or some states have done things where they've said, well, we need to have a supervisor who comes in and kind of looks or provides oversight to court appointed lawyers. That type of program in a big county you could fund that, but you can't fund that in a small county, sort of a whole extra person. Um, and then the other thing I would also say is this like rural stuff that kind of brings in is to this discussion of mentorship, right, that's come up here is that um, in rural areas, sort of local mentorship for lawyers might not be as successful. So I think it'd be great to hear from Fabio about his specific stuff here, but um, I guess my starting point is I agree that we, from my perspective, we just have to break out where we're at and how big our communities are as we look for solutions. Oh, can you hear me, Hannah? Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll pose a follow-up, and that is um, uh, almost now, it would have been 1975, 45 years ago, the Rodriguez versus San Antonio School District case. Uh, dealt with the constitutionality of uh, funding public schools through local property taxes. And the question was presented to the Supreme Court whether wealth should constitute a suspect class because wealth is the foundation of so many other forms of discrimination, so many other forms of pervasive discrimination, education, justice, and all sorts of other issues. Thurgood Marshall wrote this astonishingly uh, fantastic dissent 
stating that case very compellingly. Should we revisit uh, the, uh, the, uh, the arguments made in Rodriguez, the arguments made by Justice Marshall, so compellingly 45 years ago? So I, um, it's not a question I've thought about, um, so I can't sort of weigh in on the constitutional doctrine there, but I'd also say that I don't know um, how much it matters to this particular policy question. Um, you know, we say that we have a guarantee of, a constitutional guarantee of counsel um, in criminal cases and states guarantee counsel in other types of cases. Um, and what's nice is of course we have our Strickland standard and we do have an obligation that that counsel is effective and we probably can litigate under sort of is your counsel effective or not um, as opposed to having to get into a suspect class discussion. So I'm, unfortunately, Dr. Reed, I don't have enough uh, context to kind okay. of weigh on your ultimate question, but I do think that there's other ways to do it without getting okay. into that. Okay. Oh, it's a big provocative radical sort of question that I pose. Thanks. Sean, are you ready for me? Yep. Uh, the uh, questions I put to you are, um, that we want people who are amenable to probation to be on probation. We don't want to shut the door to probation, uh, but we also want to mitigate uh, disparate impact by social and racial and economic class. I mean, that seems to be the point you're making. Um, we want less incar incarceration, not more. We want uh, the use of probation, but um, we, we would like I, as I understand it, to expand the opportunity for, for probation. And also, if you could think about uh, some of the national impacts of what, uh, what you've presented. Sure, and I think I'll start with those. I'll push back a little bit on your observation, the notion that, you know, that we should open the door to folks who are amenable to probation as much as possible. I think part of the problem looking at that is that still doesn't change the, who's going to be successful automatically. Okay. People with money people have an education, people who are already succeeding under the system, if we try and open the doors for probation and we lower that standard, they're going to be the first at the front of the line, mm. whatever that might be. That's not going to necessarily help the issue. I think okay. what we need to look at is looking at factors which have nothing to do with your educational t uh, attainment. And I uh, push back is really what we should be looking for is Yes, we are going to be looking to put people of privilege more in prison equitably. Now, that's one. I'm all in favor of, of I'm all in favor of equity. There. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, the problem being is, and I'll use an example. You take a kid who uses, uh, simple, who uh, punches a guy in the face, takes his wallet, takes 40 bucks. Aggravated robbery breaks his face, you know, some bone in his face. That's an aggravated robbery that presumes prison. But then you have somebody who commits the white collar crime of theft for you know tens of thousands of dollars that's oh. a presumed probation sentence that's that's unfair that is inequitable i agree that, with you. absolutely yeah. and so and so look at it and then more importantly is the folks who let's say commit white collar crimes they obviously held a job they held it within an institution which probably involves some sort of finance they had uh, the ability and the intelligence to work of course they're going to look great on paper of course they're going to be able to meet questions about how you're going to react to programming and sponsorship they've probably been to school and so things like that you already have a problem that folks who are coming from a privileged background are always going to appear more amenable i think where we need to push back and say if we want less incarceration which i do think there should be movement towards that is looking at across the board what kind of crimes do we consider prison worthy starting with drug reform Minnesota's made a couple of good steps there. The national levels, we're starting to see that as well. Decriminalization of certain marijuana crimes. That has been a push away from turning that into felony level offenses. We've made a push towards more diversion. I also think that looking at the nature of possibly violence um, and to what degree, is there a difference between a one-time fight and a different where you have some unfortunately horrendous circumstances, some injuries, is that the same of someone who is chronically violent? The, you know, do we put more weight on criminal history scores and the weight of criminal violent criminal offenses as opposed to, uh, let's say, some sort of status crime, uh, violation of sex offender registration statutes? That's a mandatory prison sentence. 
right out of the gate, just for failing to turn in a form to the state of Minnesota, you are presumed to go to prison for a year and a day for failing to file a form. Let's have a conversation about what that requires. And I think we should step back and we should really look at where do we need to use prison? Um, I do think that, you know, when you have issues of incarceration, if you're not doing it equitably, which is the, I think most of the studies are showing is that the disparate impact it's had on community uh, is also going to trace along the same lines where you're going to have kind of that vortex of uh, problems with criminal issues, uh, child mortality rates, educational rates, food deserts. You know, you see a lot of overlap in these social ills. And a lot of it saying is that's simply not fair for us to take into consideration. And we, when you look at amenability to probation is we want to make, say, hey, can we give this person the education and the opportunity, job uh, access to jobs, starting small businesses? Are there other opportunities that probation can actually provide to breaking some of these chains of criminal behavior? The problem with this, and I think where we need to have another conversation is what is probation doing? I think there are a lot of probation programs which are utterly unsuccessful. They do not support uh, life learning. They do not support um, a lot of life-changing education and programs which can do better. They're doing a lot what they can, but probation officers, I'd say the culture right now is that they are more police officers. They're making sure you check the box. Have you met with this person? Have you met with this uh, social provider? Have you met with this social worker? Instead of being some sort of life coach or being some sort of mentor, they become another person enforcing saying, have you done all of these things without providing them a real support system? And I think on a bigger basis, that is an issue, not only for Minnesota, but definitely in states where you are not investing in probation. If you have a probationer and the only thing that you're doing with your probation officer is having a phone conversation every month, how can we say that's rehabilitating? And so I think this starts to bring in issues of investment with what are we doing with folks who are on probation and are we changing uh, the way that they think and they behave. There are some great programs out there that which I do think back to work programs, um, some in academy here in the cities which are specifically provide um, work and vocational training to felons. They do some great life changing work. The problem is that is not readily accessible or funded across the board. So until we start to address that as well, I'm also a little bit afraid of saying, look, you know, that probation is treated or given equally to everybody. And more importantly, those who are successful on it um, are simply, are, there's an equity in success. I don't think that's true, that there are all these ways that privilege enters into success that we need to start to take an accounting for if we truly want to claim that this is a just system and that probation is just. The other side of that, and maybe the, to push against that is shorter incarceration terms for everybody. Yes, incarceration is a huge problem. Incarceration is a devastating effect, which can have a dramatic impact. But it also shows, I think studies show that recidivism is reduced when it is a short, small uh, amount that is brought in immediately and quickly following the crime, as opposed to delaying a lengthier sentence. You know, the whole point of this is we're gonna use incarceration. The idea is that we have a fast, quick resolution, but one which is uh, an appropriate, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, it holds public safety at issue. It protects folks from recidivism, but we're not taking away, you take you out of society for 10 years and you can never be rehabilitated. I don't think that's gonna help in the long term either. And so we can kind of come at it from both angles. One, if we're gonna use incarceration that we look at reduced rates that are gonna be applied across the board, but that would get people back in society more quickly. But from the other side is we have to stop pretending like, um, you know, if you're entitled to probation, that somehow how you act and how you look and how you speak in court is in any way indicative of that. Um, and that we really should be saying, hey, your conduct, if it merits prison time, no matter who you are, where you come from, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. You know, just because that you have access to all these things that say, hey, I could respond to treatment, is that necessarily fair? And then, you know, to push against that is just because you may be amenable doesn't necessarily mean that you should have access to it. But I also buttress that with incarceration for long periods is not the right answer either. So we have to come at it, I think, from both angles. John, thank you for your pushback. I really appreciate it, uh, your, 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 your pushback there. You've made some excellent points. I hope you develop some of those points in, 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 uh, in your final paper. Thank you. Do my best. Amanda, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, are there any questions from the, the audience? There are no questions. You must have covered everything. 
with well, that, I think we're ready to take a short break. All right, I think we're ready to resume for our final panel of the day. Uh, Dr. Reed, handle the introductions. Well, thank you, Amanda. And as I've done with uh, every panel this afternoon, just in case someone has, uh, has only just joined us, I want to say that, Amanda, you have been instrumental in this. You have been heroic in this. Without your, 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 your assistance, without your, your, your performance, without everything you've done, this would have been impossible. So, Amanda, we, we salute you. You've done fantastic, fantastic work. So thank you so much. And um, under extremely difficult circumstances, the circumstances that you know, um, I, I found it very difficult to deal with. So thank you so much. And so I'd like to introduce our, uh, our presenters. Uh, we, we have two participants, two presenters this afternoon, Professor Bruce Corey uh, from Concordia University here in St. Paul will go first. He's been an advisor to the, uh, the mayor's office in the city of St. Paul. He works on economic issues with immigrant communities uh, here in the Twin Cities. And he will be here to address uh, some of these issues, issues uh, that pertain particularly to uh, inequality of wealth, race, and class. So Professor Corey, thank you. We welcome you. Thank you. Uh, it's it's great to be here, and I want to uh, wish everybody uh, a pleasant afternoon. And uh, as you said, this is these are uh, life changing times. That uh, in everybody's mind, there's only one thing, and that is the Christ, the COVID crisis. And uh, so it's good to have. Uh, conversations like this around topics. And the focus of what I thought I would share uh, was uh, my experience with economic inclusion and how we could, uh, I would end uh, with an, ex uh, an example and a discussion about the current COVID crisis and economic relief uh, that has been offered to various groups and I'd focus on small business and talk about inclusion within that context. So uh, a broad picture and then uh, uh, something more specific. So uh, as I begin, I want to, uh, as, as uh, Charles mentioned, I uh, served for about two years as uh, the Director of Planning and Economic Development uh, in the city of St. Paul uh, under the leadership of Mayor Carter. And uh, before that, I have been a professor at of economics at Concordia University and now an associate vice president of university relations. And so part of my uh, life has been also to engage with uh, the community at large and the way I've been engaging with the community is around uh, changing the narrative about immigrants and minorities from a deficit mentality to an asset. So when I first came to Minnesota in 1987. Um, I saw in the newspaper uh, a very negative portrayal of immigrants and minorities as deficits. So it would be uh, stories about welfare and criminal justice and, and all the negatives. Uh, well, at the same time, there was a parallel narrative of all the various ways that they add life to Minnesota in very strong ways. For example, I estimate if you've put uh, all the economic assets that immigrants and minorities uh, provide to Minnesota in terms of income, in terms of the houses they live, in terms of real estate, um, their income, uh, that economic asset is about $60 billion. So it's a, a big uh, ch chunk of the Minnesota economy, about 500,000 workers and about equally a number of uh, youth in the educational system. And these are all assets that are making a big difference in the life of Minnesota from the neighborhood grocery store to a high-tech executive or CEO of a corporation. A wide range of, of, of contributions. And so I documented these different contributions and uh, encouraging people to shift the way they view the community, because if you look at 
uh, a negative perspective, you're going to follow a negative route. And if you think of it in a positive way, it opens out new uh, avenues and new dimensions uh, of possibility. And so for the past three decades, I've been engaged in that and also in the uh, redistricting debates about uh, political representation. And, and my question every of these 10 years in front of the judicial panel that would ultimately decide how legislative districts are drawn in the state. My question would be, who is representing these economic interests, the $60 billion economy, and how can we make sure that these, represent, these interests are well represented? So I had this unique opportunity to lead this department. And some of you know the city of St. Paul, uh, the Department of Planning and Economic Development is that economic vehicle to help build uh, the city. And so it was a, a huge department in four major areas. There was uh, the economic development activities that range from the Ford site uh, to uh, the parking ramps that we have, a uh, hundred million dollar uh, set of parking ramps in downtown St. Paul. Uh, it would include our planners uh, that develop the long-term plans of this city as well as go and look at uh, specific things like zoning uh, and how um, life is organized, economic life is organized in the city. And also around historic preservation. Uh, I also um, had uh, the housing department, which uh, played an important role in uh, the provision of affordable housing. So just like today, when there is such a deep economic crisis in the, in the city and the state, uh, where life, economic life is almost grinding to a standstill, the same thing happened in housing in the city of St. Paul in the last recession in 2008. And the department played a very critical role in bringing life to the housing market by buying properties, and selling them at affordable late and, and jumpstarting the housing markets in Frogtown and the east side and other parts of the city. And finally, there's administration, uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, work that needs to be monitored uh, and, and, uh, and administered in the city. And so when I walked into this, um, um, this, uh, this appointment, um, my perspective was always, how could I make whatever I do work for the people I knew that were on the neighborhood level on the street? How could we bring the economic development process to the people? And so uh, the way I would do it would be to uh, talk to my team about it, but also anything that came to my desk I would ask the question, how are we going wider and how are we going deeper? And so if a developer would come with a proposal that would need my signature, uh, I would ask the question, so you see this map that I have on my wall and you can see that huge chunks of this uh, city is areas of poverty. What can you do to help us uh, build the city? And by repeatedly asking the question uh, and, and having the boots in the ground approach, uh, we began to see uh, the city, uh, two things happen. Number of employees in the city of St. Paul uh, want to do that. They want to make uh, the city work for all. And so they were empowered to do what they love to do and they would do such an excellent job uh, reaching out to uh, community groups and actively connecting with them. For example, uh, when we had this uh, loan and grant program, uh, my team would actually sit down with small business owners and uh, work with them to, uh, um, to help them say, for instance, uh, apply for this program and uh, many of them got this program for the first time that they never even knew that this kind of funding was available for the city. We also had the opportunity to um, uh, work on the, the, the comprehensive plan, the plan that would 
be in front of everybody for the next decades. And so having, looking at the different elements of the plan and with the lens of how could we connect it uh, to the, uh, to, to be inclusive of everyone, uh, how are we going deeper and wider and how are we integrating uh, the cultural uh, uh, communities in, 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 in the city uh, uh, was reflected in the final document that, that came out. And also in the area of hiring, um, we uh, uh, asking the question, how can we get the city to be reflective of the people we serve? Um, and, and making sure that the people we hire had connections, had this vision of going deeper and wider. And, uh, and, and uh, that is where uh, there was a lot of success too. So I'm gonna put up a couple of slides and talk about it as I, I do so. And uh, which kind of uh, provides um, um, a framework of what I've been sharing. So uh, the perspective I'm, I, I'm framing what I do these days is on my site, website called empoweringstrategies.org. And the work that I do is inspired by these leaders you see on the screen, uh, Dr. King, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Paulo Freire, and Nelson Mandela, and Mother Teresa. And so you see all of these people did a phenomenal work in the world. They inspired the human spirit to cause change. So Dr. King and the civil rights movement uh, in uh, this country, changing the way this country uh, lived and related to each other. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who uh, used the power of truth force to topple the British empire and bring about independence of India. Uh, Nelson Mandela, who did the same thing in South Africa and Paulo Freire, who uh, talked about a strategy of how uh, and showed ways in which ordinary people can be empower empowered to change their own destiny. And finally, Mother Teresa, who showed the power of compassion uh, and how ultimately what all we do uh, has to touch and make a difference uh, on, the, on the most vulnerable. So if anybody wants to find out a little bit about the summary of the work that I did in the city of St. Paul, this was an op-ed I wrote that documented some of these, um, the strategies that I mentioned here. One of the things that I was uh, very involved with in the city of St. Paul was how can we celebrate the cultures, the diverse cultures of the city and at the same time create wealth. And in order to do that, we, uh, even before I uh, was with the city, I worked um, with community groups uh, around the time when they were building the Green Line. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the same thing that happened in the old African-American community of Rhonda would not happen again in that area with light rail. So we began talking and out of that came up this concept of how can we celebrate the cultures in the, in the area and use it also as an opportunity for economic development. And from there arose these concepts called the World Cultural Heritage District. You'll see the world in your neighborhood and uh, develop concepts like uh, Little Africa by Jean Jeljalu, uh, Little Mekong, uh, Vamento, Rondo, a number of people like Naita Presley and um, Marvin Anderson, uh, where you'd go and you can see the pictures on this slide, you'd see the Little Mekong Night Market, you'd see the section of Selby that were full of food trucks uh, that uh, offered soul food and brought the African American experience. Or if you go down to Minneapolis, the Native American concept in uh, uh, 
in the American Indian Cultural Corridor. Um, or if you walk into an African immigrant restaurant, uh, you would get the experience of African cultures. Uh, or if you go to the Mercado Central uh, and or the Somali Souk and Karmal Mall, you'll find the buzz of, of the bazaar. Um, and as you get this experience, you also engaging the entrepreneur is celebrating their own cultural heritage and is empowered by doing that, but offering also a service to the people in the food and the music, in the uh, 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 art that uh, customers engage with, and this would help in turn uh, to grow their own wealth. So that was the cultural destination area strategy. And, and since I uh, left the city, I've been working, uh, continue to work on this concept to promote these cultural destinations in low income communities, where they could be a very effective uh, strategy for economic development. Um, and, and so um, you'll find uh, a number of these um, concepts emerging all over uh, the Twin Cities areas. And uh, it is, St. Paul is fortunate to have a number of these concepts uh, closely uh, connected to each other. Uh, turning now to uh, the COVID crisis uh, with the coronavirus and, and uh, uh, how we are uh, struggling to relate to it and trying to think where it might go. My own thinking is that based on what I've seen and talking to entrepreneurs, that uh, we are going to be hit by a very hard economic tsunami that's going to parallel the health crisis. And it's going to take a deep toll on especially small micro businesses. Many of them might just be wiped out. And so we've got to think about strategies that would benefit everyone. And so I offer this tool on my LinkedIn page and on social media of as people see these different programs that have been offered in the current crisis, how do we start looking at it and how do we make sure that they are inclusive, that everyone benefits from it? So uh, on the columns, you have the, 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 the stakeholders or the categories and the other four columns are some major programs that have been offered including the ones that you'll see coming out of Congress. One would be uh, forgivable loans that uh, a business owner would be given loan that could be forgiven if they maintain their employment, employees. The SBA, the Small Dis Business Administration has its uh, low interest loans for about 3.75% over 30 years for up to $2 million. Has a wide range of use that you could do it. Uh, there have been calls to freeze foreclosures, mortgages, utility rents, because people are losing their jobs and they can't afford to pay, uh, meet their monthly payments. And then uh, protection from predatory lenders because uh, predatory lending is as insidious as the COVID virus. Uh, just yesterday, uh, after a six month struggle, uh, a group of nonprofits and a bank uh, helped an immigrant female business owner out of get out of the clutches of a predatory lender who in the heart of the COVID crisis as we are trying to put the money together to pay off this credit lender that predatory lender raised the value of the loan by five thousand dollars all over the country you're hearing inspiring stories of people helping each other this predatory lender was actually trying to destroy this person by raising the price so that the person is unable to pay. The way predatory lenders work is they, they, they offer an easy product, an easy loan, but then if you don't look at the fine line, this person actually was paying over 200% in interest and fees on a loan in 2020. It's unthinkable, but that is the nature of greed. Uh, and, and that's what uh, we have to keep an eye on, especially today as a lot of people are going to go under and where they're going to get the sources of funding for it. 
so on this axis, the inclusion part in the fire where I have the green component, uh, how would we make sure that these programs reach the wide range of business, businesses without employees? And this would be people in the gig economy. This would be people in the self-employed, uh, home-based businesses, small people, uh, sorry, small business owners. Then you could have uh, businesses that have less than a million dollars in revenue and probably 90% of businesses in the US are in that category with employees. And then business, small businesses greater than a million dollars in revenue. And then some dimensions of inclusion like, does the business have the capacity to deal with the change? And let me give you an example. So I was working with a, a small female owned business uh, who ran a beautiful restaurant and uh, she uh, is now the sole person in that restaurant and facing the fact of should I be in my home looking after my kids or should I be here uh, where you know, people trickle into the restaurant and I talked to her I said how about let's uh, doing uh, uh, takeout uh, as a way to get income for in this time of decline and the challenges uh, she would face is one, I don't have a functioning website. Two, if I get, uh, if I'm popular and I get 20 people coming for, a, for, for something, I'm a single person here, how am I going to serve them? And if I don't serve them well, they're going to put uh, negative reviews on the website of how bad I am. So the capacity of a business to take advantage of this, uh, the, the facility and or the change uh, the, the next column would be the, the capacity of the business to take debt because a lot of businesses are all overloaded in debt and you're offering them a loan. And the, the thought about taking another loan when they are trying to meet the existing loan obligation is really something that's beyond their ability. And then finally, how do you intentionally include groups that have been traditionally marginalized like minority groups that already face barriers in capital and access to resources, uh, disabled businesses, for example, too. How do you look at all these groups and make sure that that program works for them? And then you have the people who are actually maybe delivering these programs, the nonprofit organizations, do they have the capacity to do it within, within their, cur culture, uh, their current capacity? So, um, so inclusion during the COVID business uh, relief strategy is going to be very important and it's going to take the whole village and all of us to make sure that they work well. So I'm going to end here by uh, just summarizing what I just said. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is to offer uh, some strategies, empowering strategies to, um, uh, to bring about economic development and my work in government uh, provides some perspective on how can a bureau bureaucracy, a government bureaucracy be inclusive. And what I what I found, and, and because I'm an economist, I have the data too, what I have and can show with the facts that it is possible for uh, a government agency to be inclusive, to make sure that pro their programs reach the people on the street. It, it is possible and it has been done. Um, with the strategy around cultural destinations, it's a blue ocean strategy. It's, it's something that people have not tapped in enough of how uh, we elevate what has been neglected over the, over the years and that is to celebrate the cultures of, of minorities and immigrants and at the same time make it an avenue for wealth building. And then finally, as we implement strategies to the crisis right now. And this crisis, when we come after it, is going to be a new America. Uh, how do we make sure that uh, it's going to work for all and is going to make sure that everyone uh, comes out of it ahead? Not because we are living in a society where power is concentrated and each uh, and, and, and very little ultimately is trickling down to the people with the least power. So how can you flip that and make sure that it works for all? So I'll end there and uh, uh, hear the other presentations and be open to your questions. Thank you. Professor Corey, thank you so much. I have some questions for you and I'll 
I'll pose them at, at the end. I also would like now to introduce Barry Yeoman. I've read his work. You, you, he's written some very important work in, in uh, journals like The Nation. His recent focus has been on questions of rural poverty, race, access to justice. Uh, he, um, he's done some very important work. Um, and um, he is adjunct, he's a freelance author. He is also an adjunct professor of journalism at both Wake Forest University and at Duke University. And uh, so I would like to welcome you. You're in the Carolinas right now? Yes, I'm home um, in Durham, North Carolina. Well, welcome, welcome to Minnesota. Thank you. This is actually my second Minnesota visit of the day. So okay, I am, I am happy to be here. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Um, so Charles reached out to me after I wrote a series of articles about the impact of um, industrial scale hog farming in North Carolina. And what, what, what he said at the time was that he felt it was important to have a, a, a look at a rural uh, um, environmental justice issues. Um, partly as a reminder that poverty is not simply an urban issue, that, that many of these issues play out um, in different ways um, in rural areas. And I think to appreciate what is happening right now in rural Eastern North Carolina, um, it's useful to go back to 1986 when I first moved here. I, I, um, I, I live in Durham. It is a, a post-industrial city of about 250,000 people. Uh, it was much smaller when I moved here in 1986. And when I moved here, every morning when I woke up, the first smell that hit me was the smell of tobacco. Um, the, the Liggett Meyer factory was not far from my house. The American tobacco a factory was was slightly beyond that, and uh, tobacco jobs were good jobs um, in the city. They were they um, uh, the American tobacco jobs were union jobs, and that plant closed in 1987, uh, and was surrounded by razor wire for many years. Um, in the late 90s, early aughts, the Liggett Meyer plant closed down. And that was happening, that was playing out across North Carolina. Um, and as, as the local tobacco industry imploded, city, uh, I'm sorry, state agricultural leaders and uh, political leaders started to think about what can replace the revenue lost by uh, the, the declining tobacco industry. And what they came up with was hog farming. Um, in the past, Hog farming in North, North Carolina meant you were actually a tobacco farmer or a cotton farmer, and you, you had a few hogs on the side. Um, but, but we took a cue from, from the Midwest, and we also took a cue from the poultry industry. Uh, the poultry industry in North Carolina has been a vertically integrated industry for uh, many years, and um, a man named Wendell Murphy, uh, who lives in North Carolina, uh, a, a, a hog industry entrepreneur um, started um, looking to poultry uh, vertical integration and asking how can that be applied to um, the hog industry. Fast forward to the present and what we have is a contract farming system that looks very much like the, the contract farming system for chickens, except it's for pigs, uh, which are much bigger. And um, so um, most of the farmers in North Carolina who raise large amounts of hogs um, uh, do so under contract to a large, a large hog company. In most cases, it's Smithfield Farms, which is, uh, which is the largest pork producing company in the world. It's owned by a Chinese company. And um, the farmers own the land and they own the buildings and Smithfield owns the hogs and it owns the, um, the, the, the process. It, um, it dictates the process of how these hogs will be raised. Um, the hog, the, 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 the hogs are raised indoors 
in barns that hold over 1,000 hogs each, over 1,200 hogs each. Um, the largest hog farms have 60,000 animals. Uh, um, you know, you know, very common to have hog farms with you know between 1,000 and 10,000, and the waste is uh, flushed into lagoons, which are large open pits where they they undergo bacterial action and are then sprayed on the fields as fertilizer. Um, the hog the hog industry says this is the most um, most most viable and cost effective way of disposing hog waste, and people who live near these farms say it makes their lives hell. Um, they talk about the smell of living near a hog farm as unbearable. It's not all the time, but it is unpredict it's unpredictable and it is intermittent. Um, one woman who I talked to, who lives right next door to a farm, talked about it as if you had a baby who had diarrhea and you left their diaper in the car overnight and came back to it the next morning. Um, it has, has, um, has curtailed outdoor activity um, in a part of North Carolina where outdoor activity is everything. People live outdoors. They have picnics. They have, um, they, they have gatherings. They dance outside. They play ball games outside. The kids play outside. They have barbecues. And that's become, uh, in many places, virtually impossible, say the people who live there. Um, the, um, the, there is also considerable evidence of, um, of health impacts. Um, for, for, for quite a number of years now, um, epidemiologists have looked at, um, various, um, um, ailments, everything from headaches and respiratory issues to depression and stress and anxiety, um, asthma symptoms, and they have seen um, an association between living or attending school near a hog farm and suffering many of these symptoms. Now, we should say an association is not proof of cause, but there have been, uh, there have been numerous studies that have been, um, that have had similar results suggesting that living within a, a certain radius of a hog farm is likely to be associated with, with, um, with both emotional and physical symptoms. Um, it is also associated with being a person of color. Um, Steve Wing, who is an epidemiologist at the University of North Carolina before he died, um, did, did a really seminal study in which he said, he found that, that, that if you draw uh, circles around industrial scale hog farms, you are more likely to, to live in that circle if you are African American, Latino, or Native American than if you were white. And so this becomes an environmental justice issue um, because of the, 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 the disproportionate impacts. Hog farming is big business and the hog industry has historically been deeply politically uh, uh, connected. I had referenced Wendell Murphy, who was the leading entrepreneur um, of this push into vertical integration of hog farming. Well, he also spent a decade in the state legislature. He, he was both a stout, state house member and then a state senator. And um, he and his allies, you know, uh, 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 during that time in the 20th century, passed a number of bills that protected the industry. Um, for example, outlawed the, the local zoning of um, hog farms, um, of, of large hog farms. Um, uh, created sales tax exemptions for, for, for animal agriculture. And, and there has been a, um, a series of laws passed 
um, all the way through up until the present, which, uh, which critics say have given a uh, preferential treatment to large animal agriculture. And so what you get in North Carolina, in Eastern North Carolina, is this real conflict uh, where, where, um, where people who live near hog, hog farms, many of them poor, many of them people of color, um, are, um, are up against uh, yeah, a group of contract farmers who are, um, who are working for the largest pork industry in the world, a, an, an, a, 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 an enormous and politically powerful um, entity with a lot of allies in the state legislature. Um, I've been reporting on the hog industry. Um, I, I spent a good deal of last year doing so, and I, and I did so working with a number of media organizations, primarily under the uh, sponsorship of a nonprofit journalism organization called the Food and Environment Reporting Network. Uh, uh, FERN, as it's called, um, funds and publishes um, in-depth enterprising, serious investigative reporting about food and ag. And in the first project that we did, we partnered with the Midwest Center for Investigative Reporting. And um, the Midwest Center did um, a, a public records requests asking for complaints against uh, animal operations in North Carolina, in really all of the top animal agriculture states. And in many of those states, in Iowa, in Texas, um, when the records came back, there were, um, there were thousands of records. When the records came back in North Carolina, there were a little over 30, um, which means that um, it could mean either of two things. Either hog farms are really hunky-dory and no one is complaining, uh, meaning no neighbors are complaining, or that neighbors are complaining and the public records are being withheld. And what we what we learned, and you know, this is this is a really systemic issue, is that in 2014, the state legislature passed a law that sealed complaints by members of the public against agricultural operations unless they were proven, meaning unless there was an enforcement action taken by a state regulator. And as it turns out, the, 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 the state regulators um, very rarely make enforcement actions. What I was told by people who have followed this closely, who have represented um, uh, both, uh, both, uh, both environmental and environmental justice groups is that many of these inspections have kind of a casual bent. So an inspector shows up at a hog farm the inspector maybe knows the farmer, sees some deficiencies, and says to the farmer, hey, you've got some deficiencies. If you fix them, I won't write you up. And so the farmer maybe fixes them, and they don't get written up, and therefore there is never a public record. And, um, and so not only do we have a situation where people are, people say that they're being affected in terrible ways in terms of their, their quality of life, but any efforts to get information about it, you know, meet this black box of state law. Um, people are fighting back. And I think this is important. Um, in a lot of places that I have traveled in my life, it seems like environmental activists and environmental justice activists are operating in very different worlds um, where, where the largely white middle-class um, environmentalists like clean water people are thinking about the water, thinking about the wildlife, thinking about the air, and environmental justice folks are thinking about where, you know, clean water, clean air, and, um, you know, people's lives intersect. And in North Carolina, those groups are actually working in partnership. Uh, it's really impressive to see groups like 
the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, which is led by people of color, and the Waterkeepers Alliance, which I would say has a predominantly white um, cons con constituency working hand in hand. And so um, they've, they've worked at the administrative level, for example, fi uh, filing a title, uh, title VI civil rights complaint um, with, with the Environmental Justice Agency um, saying that how North Carolina um, regulates hog farms is racially discriminatory and therefore uh, illegal um, and have filed um, state administrative actions. And also uh, in 2014, 2015, um, there were 20 odd lawsuits filed on behalf of more than 500 North Carolinians, mostly African-American, um, against Smithfield's uh, pork production su subsidiary, um, Murphy Farm, um, saying that they were public nuisances. Um, and five of those cases have gone to, to trial. The plaintiffs have won all of them. Um, the, the, the rulings, uh, have carried um, um, uh, judgments um, that have ranged from relatively small to um, to about $100 million. Um, actually, the jury verdict was almost $500 million. It was scaled back because of a, a cap on punitive damage, but, but, but it was still, still nearly $100 million. And those... Um, some of those cases have been appealed to the Fourth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals, and the court um, had a hearing in January. Uh, the the uh, uh, lead judge in that case, um, who was uh, J. Harvey Wilkinson III, a Reagan appointee, uh, was pretty sympathetic to the plaintiffs and seemed pretty hostile to Smithfield, um, suggested that if the neighbors of these hog farms were, to, to, to quote Judge Wilkinson McMansions, that maybe we wouldn't be here at all. Um, so the neighbors are waiting for the Fourth Circuit's ruling. Um, it is due at some unspecified time in the future. But meanwhile, this, this, um, th this fight remains active and uh, lively, and maybe I'll stop here and wait for questions. Uh, you are muted, Charles. Am I now unmuted? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Fabulous. I have questions for both of you, and, and, um, and uh, the questions are, first I'll begin with Professor Corey. And uh, when I heard your presentation, I really see two different papers. One uh, reflecting your work in the mayor's office in ordinary times, let's call them the before times, the before times, before COVID, uh, looking at questions of, of empowerment, looking at questions of inclusion. And I see your presentation then on COVID as being uh, very different in character because of the crisis situation uh, we are facing. And I'll pose a question to you, and that is, uh, as I contemplate COVID, I teach labor law here at, at the University of St. Thomas, and I posed this question to my, my labor law class a couple of weeks ago as COVID uh, came up on the horizon. And that is the issue of, of, of social, a social and economic class and, and employment particularly. Um, we will see an enormous disparate impact uh, on the basis of, uh, of wealth, on the basis of class, on the basis of race, as we watch COVID cut through um, the United States. And um, I'm wondering if you could amplify on that. And then I'm going to pose a question to, uh, to Barry, Barry Yeoman, and that is, um, I will... Um, raised to uh, you uh, back, I think, last summer or fall, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation 
financed a, a, sim a simulation of a pandemic outbreak. The pandemic outbreak uh, that they simulated actually uh, involved cross-species um, transmission of virus, and it was the simulation was used uh, to frame the cross-species transmission were the large-scale industrial hog farms of Brazil. Are, are you familiar with this? No, I'm not. Um, and uh, raising the issue of um, of the health of, of these hog farms uh, very squarely. Now, this was some months ago. This was, I think, August or September. And uh, we are watching now. Again, I, I will bring some of your work back into the um, in, into the uh, into the present and into this time of pandemic. And ask you, uh, you know, your your work seems more relevant, important than ever. And ask you how we can aggressively use not only nuisance law but perhaps even public health law to uh, address some of the the, uh, the the huge disparities that we see I, see with hog farms. I my daughter goes to college in Wisconsin, and and I bring her home every summer and from campus. And um, the, we drive through these rural highways in Wisconsin. The smell of hog farms penetrating, intense, uh, unlivable. Uh, you, you can recognize them a mile away. How do we use public health as well as nuisance law to try to constrain some of the, the, these obvious dangers? I think it's a fascinating question to which I have no answers. But, but, but I will say that, that a lot of the original epidemiology um, I shouldn't say a lot. Some of the original epidemiology did look at uh, hog farm workers and showed many of the same um, um, associations that, that, that neighbors had experienced. And so my, my impulse as a journalist is that we need to continue documenting the public health issues involved um, I think that, you know, the fact that the neighbor studies have shown associations and not necessarily, uh, uh, ca ca causality indicates to me that there's still important work that has to be done, both in terms of the health, um, implications for neighbors and the health implications for workers. Um, any, um, any policy tools need to, to, to be grounded in sound science. And I, um, I'm hoping that, that one of the outcomes of the pandemic is that people um, who, are, who, who are, are directing research dollars recognize the links between a, a, animal agriculture and health and start funding those dollars in, in that direction. Um, there has um, there has long been, you know, political advocacy work um, around the live animal markets in China, and um, guess what? Um, you know that it that appears to be the the uh, 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 the source of COVID nineteen. Um, we are not going to have effective policy instruments until we, we ha have lots of data. And so I hope that that data is forthcoming. Thank you. And Professor Corey. Uh, good question. Um, one of the great stories of recent months have been the lower, the unemployment rates in minority and immigrant communities going down and income levels going up because they're finding jobs and strategies like the minimum wage increasing, uh, adding to income levels. And um, there's a, even among uh, the minority groups, there's a range of occupational categories. So some people are in the uh, low skill, low income sectors like the hospitality and the restaurant business and others are in the high skill technologies, uh, I mean, sectors of, of software and technology. 
And so the positive uh, news was a lot of people in the low income, low skilled areas were getting jobs and moving up the scale. And now suddenly that's the first to be uh, attacked. Those were the first to close. Uh, and so um, the troubling uh, thought would be that uh, the new economy that might result as a result of all this change that might happen if this goes as what some people in the most extreme version of it, uh, a restructuring of the economy itself. So how do we uh, start thinking and preparing for this change and uh, a short term and a long term um, approach. And, and, and right now I'm thinking uh, uh, in, in the short run, having kind of like the three P's of uh, a COVID economic strategy. And one is uh, the providing of resources uh, very, in a very inclusive way. Uh, as I mentioned to you, the, the example with business assistance, small business assistance, uh, the protection of people, uh, like protection from predatory lending, protecting from scams that are going to arise and playing on people's fears, uh, protection of individual rights, like uh, the onslaught that's happening against Asian communities because uh, we are... Uh, having another excuse to, to legitimize uh, discrimination. And so protection and the rule of law is uh, terribly important right now. And the third is the promotion. And that is how do we market the small business? How do we connect people to resources? How do we build, uh, uh, in this case of the example I gave you of predatory lending, it took a village to save that business. So how do we come together uh, to, in very creative ways to build this, build up after, during and after this disaster? So I hope that answers your question. Well, thank you. Amanda, do we have questions from the audience? We do. Uh, the first is for Mr. Yeoman. Would you be able to comment on the fight going on in Iowa over the Raccoon River? There, the Raccoon River provides water to Des Moines after flowing through agricultural areas and is increasingly polluted with the agricultural runoff. How might the fight over rural pollution and its association with poverty change as the impacts come to more urban centers? So, um, so Iowa is outside my wheelhouse. Um, I will answer the second half of that question. Um, I um, I think that um, frequently um, frequently activists are siloed, and and what um, what happens in rural Iowa, North Carolina, wherever becomes invisible um, to folks who live in the cities, who are the folks who. Uh, have more access to um, power. Um, there needs to be proactive um, alliance building between between rural and urban interests, um, which often um, translate into uh, between um, environmental and environmental justice interests. And, and that kind of coalition building has to happen well in advance. It has to happen before um, be, you know, the impacts are, are found in the city. Um, um, if we have learned anything from the last few weeks, it is that um, the, the, uh, there really are no boundaries. There are no um, borders that are, that are um, impermeable. And, um, and uh, I, I, I do feel like, like North Carolina has offered a model of um, uh, cooperation between, between um, you know, middle class, largely urban and suburban um, environmental activists and rural um, um, you know, mostly people of color environmental justice activists. And I do feel like 
um, like like folks in other states are um, are well advised to um, build similar coalitions. Thank you. Uh, our, call, our next question is going to be for Professor Corey. How can the legal system aid in what you mentioned will be an extremely harmful effect to micro businesses as a result of COVID-19? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Could you say it again? Yeah. How can the legal system aid in what you mentioned will be an extremely harmful effect to micro businesses as a result of COVID-19? That's a very great question. It was not only with, uh, with in COVID-19, but even before COVID-19, there's a lot of technical assistance given to micro assistance or my micro business. But one thing that they're really lacking and really need is legal assistance. So in this case of this predatory lending, for example, this uh, African immigrant female entrepreneur uh, was suddenly foreclosed, received a notice of foreclosure on her property. Now the question is for an average person is, how do I respond to it? Am I going to lose my property right now? And uh, how am I going to answer uh, the summons? And, and so she goes to the court, uh, the sheriff's office because it's the sheriff's sale. Uh, and she's sitting there and wondering, what should I do? Uh, what I should be saying? And would it hurt me to say something? And fortunate, uh, there was a pro bono attorney that was recruited to help her and she could call and ask the question. And that same attorney uh, helped her uh, during this whole process of, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, responding legally and closing the loan. Uh, but I find that is uh, the protection from the law is such a great need, but so much, uh, very little available for the average person and if there's one big effort that the legal community can do uh, is to uh, really uh, offer a lot of these pro bono kind of activities in partnership with organizations serving micro business. All right, well, I would just uh, like to wrap up by thanking everybody that took the time to present today. We had some wonderful discussion on a variety of topics. Um, and I look to forward to the papers. I, I really know. look forward to the papers. This promises to be a landmark journal. The, yeah. the, this issue promises to be a landmark. It's an important topic and an important time. I wanna thank you all again for participating. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thanks very much. We'd like to also thank our sponsor, the uh, Minnesota State Bar Association Tax Group. Uh, that was so wonderful to support us in our endeavors today and uh, thank you for everybody that took the time to attend at one point uh, we had 140 people watching so holy smoke excellent turnout. Wow. yes all right and with that i'm gonna end our symposium but thank you everybody thank, thank, you. You, all. thank you thank all. you all thank you all